tonight, the eyes of the baseball world are focused on this man, Gaylord Perry of the Seattle Mariners. During his 20 years of pitching Major League Baseball, which started with the Giants, he's accumulated a record of 299 wins, 241 losses, in winning the Cy Young Award in both leagues. On April 20th of this year, Gaylord struck out 13 batters in a game en route to a 6-4 win over the California Angels. The 40th time in his career, he spanned 10 or more batters in a game. He also chalked up career victory number 298 in that game. Then on April 30th at the big ballpark in the Bronx Yankee Stadium, Gaylord pitched eight and two-thirds innings in a 6-3 win over the New York Yankees for win number 299. And tonight at the Kingdom, Seattle, Washington, the 43-year-old right-hander goes for a page in the record book, a place in the Hall of Fame, as he goes after victory number 300 of his Major League career. And we'll bring it all to you right here on the USA Network. is brought to you by Budweiser. For all you do, this Bud's for you. And by Toyota, who invites you to test drive the sporty 1982 Corolla hardtop at your local Toyota dealer. Oh, what a feeling to drive a Toyota. Good evening, everybody. I'm Monty Moore, along with Wes Parker. We're here tonight for a big one, maybe the biggest game ever played at the Kingdom in Seattle since they played their first game here. It's Gaylord Perry going for his 300th Major League victory to become only the 15th man in history to do that. And our broadcast partner is Wes Parker, a man who has spent some time in the big leagues bagging against Gaylord, and I know you're kind of excited tonight, too, Wes. He's a good fellow. That's one reason I'm rooting for him, Monty. He's a wonderful guy. He's been a good friend of mine, really, for quite a while and a tremendous competitor. I think people don't realize what a tough competitor he has been throughout the years. You hear people say, well, if you didn't have that spitter, you wouldn't have gotten this far. But really, it's a lot more than that. He's a wonderful guy, a wonderful pitcher. And I've never seen anybody win 300 games before. I'd like to see it. Well, the crowd right here at the Seattle Kingdom is standing in mass. They're expecting about 40,000 for the game tonight. And they have just introduced Gaylord Perry, the old farmer from out in North Carolina. West you mentioned that Gaylord Perry is a, is, is a competitor, and that he is. He's one of the best. He is 43 years old, the oldest man pitching in the big leagues today. He's won two games this year. He beat the Yankees in his last uh, outing for win number 299. What has made him such a good pitcher and so durable all these years? He's had a great sinker ball. That's one thing. He's big. He's six four, weighs over 200 pounds, so he's strong. He has that kind of endurance. As to as to what he's got inside, it's hard to say how he got to be that way. Of course, he grew up on a farm. He was a, a farmer. Maybe that kind of environment just instilled something in him. But I've never seen a guy who hated to be taken out of a game more than Gaylord Perry. When that manager would come out, like when he was with the Giants, when I was playing against him, and ask for the ball, he, he would just not want to give it to him. He would stare down the manager as he was walking out to take him out of the game. And he's playing for a manager now who's the youngest manager in the major leagues, and he's the oldest player in the major leagues. His manager, Renee Latchman, is 37 years old. Kind of unusual and ironic. Yeah. You know what else is ironic is that Gaylord has played for so many different teams. The Yankee, the uh, Giants, who he started with, finally traded him to Cleveland for Sam McDowell. Sam was a good pitcher, but throughout the years, he didn't have the caliber of a Gaylord pair, and you'd think back and wonder why the Giants would let a guy like that go. Well, one thing that's interesting here tonight is that his wife, uh, Blanche, uh, has seen every game that he's pitched this year. His brother, Jim, who together with Gaylord formed the winningest brother combination in Major League Baseball history, is here. His 19-year-old daughter from North Carolina is here tonight. And his teammates are rooting very, very hard. We were talking with the pitching coach of the Mariners, Dave Duncan, who was a catcher, oddly enough, in the big leagues and caught Gaylord for two years. And they're all very excited about this game, as are we. I remember Wally Moon saying that baseball is an endurance contest. This is Gaylord Perry's. 20th year. That's just in the major leagues. That doesn't count about four more years in the minor leagues. He has endured. Well, 
we're going to endure a commercial right now. We'll be right back with the first pitch of the ball game between the New York Yankees and the Seattle Mariners. You're watching Thursday Night Baseball on the USA Cable Network. Well, here we go. Gaylord Perry. Oh, number 36. Ready to go after the New York Yankees, and the Yankees have won nine games and lost 13 this year. Who would ever have thought, Wes Parker, when we started the season early this year on the USA Network, that would be here tonight and see the Seattle Mariners with a better one-loss record than the New York Yankees? Quite a surprise. The Mariners have won 12 games and lost 15. Last year at this time, the Mariners were 8-18. Eight and 18. It was a bad enough record for Maury Wills, their manager, that they decided to make a change. And one year ago tonight, they changed to Rene Latchman as a manager. And now here is Willie Randolph, the Yankees' second baseman. And Gaylord is underway, says plate umpire Ken Kaiser. Got to have his control money. He just painted the outside corner. Randolph having quite a start. 341 batting average. Can't say that about a whole lot of the Yankees. Strike two. They expected 40,000 people to be here tonight. I don't think there's that many. It looks like about 25,000, but the ones who are here are very, very vocal. Kind of hard to uh, estimate the crowd in this ballpark. I'm not in it that much. There are some of the things that Gaylord goes through that irritates just about everybody except his own teammates. And there was the sinker. <laughs> and Jim Mailer at first base has got it. Now that's the ball that so many of the players in the major leagues say that Gaylord Perry is loading up. It's the sinker. He also throws another pitch that sinks, though, Wes, and that's the fork ball. Yeah, that's the fork ball. I, I would hate to have to distinguish between the two. You, when you see him start to do that as a hitter, you, you almost want to step out and wait a minute for the wet stuff to dry off the ball <laughs> because you know he's getting it somewhere up there. He has said that he's won a lot of ball games with the so-called spitter or grease ball or whatever. He says more than throwing it, just making the batters think that he's throwing it. He's right. If you know that there's a possibility that that ball is going to come up there straight and all of a sudden the bottom come out of it, you have something else to think about. Here's Ken Griffey, who at this time last year was playing for the Cincinnati Reds. Strike call, and he hasn't thrown anything but strikes yet. Gaylord this year is 1-2, lost 2. His earned run average, 3.72. Pitch is inside of all. It's interesting to note, a lot of people had speculated that once Perry, who signed with the Mariners this year on a, as he called it, a day-to-day -day contract, a lot of people speculated that he would be released as soon as he got his 300th win because that then would take away the money value to the ball club. But that's what Dan O'Brien says is not true. And he's the baseball general manager here. He says they plan on Gaylord being here all year and winning 12 to 15 games. Which he will probably do. He won eight last year in, what, about a half a season. Jerry Mumphrey on deck for the Yankees. Here two weeks ago or so, Wes and I were up here at the Kingdom. And there's that sinker, and he busted that one through there pretty good. Two balls, two strikes on Ken Griffey. A couple of weeks ago, we were up here and going down the elevator. Uh, after the ball game, there was a man standing in the back of the elevator with a notepad. And his name was Gene Michael. And he was up here scouting for the Yankees, the Seattle Ball Club. It was that night when he got back to the hotel that George Steinbrenner, the Yankees owner, called him and told him that he was to be the manager of the Yankees the next night in Anaheim. He had been the manager before. Look out. <laughs> See if this one sinks. <laughs> it did it sink. <laughs> oh, bad hop. Played well by Cruz, and he throws him out. Well, Gaylord even wrote a book about it, Me and the Spitter, Me and My Spitter, or something like that. I forget. He said in the book that he used to throw it, but that he doesn't throw it anymore. Why don't I believe him? Maybe because very few guys can make a ball sink as he made that last one sink. <laughs> Here's Jerry Mumphrey, the Yankee center fielder, the only Yankee who has played in every game the Yankees have played this year. That indicates to you they've had some changing lineups. 
Mumphrey's batting 276 overall. He's a switch hitter at 333 from this, the left side of the plate. 194 from the other side. Strike call on the outside corner. A historical moment in Major League Baseball. A man trying to win his 300th Major League victory as a pitcher. There have been only 14 men in the history of the game do it. The last one was early win in 1963 against Kansas City. While early win was pitching for the Cleveland Indians. And he didn't get signed that year until June. He was sitting around just hoping that somebody would give him a chance at number 300. He needed only one more win to get 300. And the White Sox let him go. It's inside for a ball. Right. And finally he got picked up in June. I think he had a couple of starts in June. Finally won number 300 in July. A month after he was picked up and started pitching. There's the newest Yankee of them all. John Mayberry. Just came here. This is the first game he will have played as a New York Yankee from Toronto. Two balls and a strike count. Mumphrey fouls it down and it's two and two now. Don't know what that was, but it went down too, Monty. It's either a fork ball or you might be getting something. He usually saves that wet pitch, though, for when he really needs an out, like with two strikes or runners on base. The fork ball will do a whole lot as a spitter or grease ball will do, other than the fork ball is not quite as fast. It's not a fast pitch. It's almost a changeup. Driving to right center field. There's nobody in that gap. Jerry Mumphrey can run and he may go for three. He's on his way. They got a shot at him. He slides in around the tag, which was just a little bit off from Todd Cruz. So Mumphrey's in with a two-out triple for the Yankees. Almost looked like he guessed that he was going to see a sinker and got out and got ahead of it. Now, the center fielder plays this ball perfectly. That Simpson makes a good throw. Cruz relays it. Cruz has a strong arm, the shortstop. Todd Cruz, that is. Throws a little offline, but if that throw had been online, it might have hit the runner in the back. What happened on the relay from Simpson, short hop the shortstop, and the relay from the shortstop, short hop the third baseman. If they'd have had both those balls in the air, they probably would have gotten him. Now here's John Mayberry. He was playing with the Toronto Blue Jays, and boy, does Seattle have on a radical defensive shift for Mayberry. And there's a strike. Mayberry one time averaged over 100 runs batted in a year for a five or six year stretch for the Kansas City Royals. Boy, their shortstop is playing in mid center field. Their second baseman is playing in short right field. The first baseman is still in Seattle, but he is very far down the line. There are two out on Mayberry. There's the fork ball which he throws a whole lot to left-handed batters because it goes down and away from a left-handed batter. No score. We're just underway. Two down in the first inning. Gaylord Perry, the man of the hour. Ooh, did you see that go down? <laughs> oh, did that thing sink or what? If he throws that pitch for a strike all night long, he'll pitch a shutout. You know, the Yankees picked up John Mayberry. They had all kinds of first basemen go through there because up until tonight, they have had one home run hit by a left-handed batter at Yankee Stadium this year. And if you'll recall through the history of the Yankees, their famous pennant porch in right field is one of the reasons that they had so many left-handed hitters in their lineup who have done so well over the years. And this year, with Reggie Jackson gone and Greg Nettles hurt, they just haven't had anybody hit the ball out at Yankee Stadium. Maybe this guy can do it for him. It's his first at bat as a Yankee. He just reported today. Gaylord, even with a runner at third and two down, is throwing off the stretch here, and he threw the sinker. Three and two count. I don't know if our cameras could take a shot of their second baseman or not but boy I'll tell you here's here's as deep as you're ever going to see an infielder play against anybody in baseball Bull 
count. Three balls, two strikes. Mumphrey down off third. Popped him up on the infield, and Todd Cruz, the shortstop, is there, and that's all. A play, there's no score. The Mariners are coming to bat. Let's pause now for this message from your local station. Hey, they've got to make some mistakes because George Sidebrenner definitely yeah, made some moves that, over there. That's right. That's right. They've made so doggone many moves, and I think he does it emotionally. He gets upset about something, and boom, the guy's gone the next day. Like, look at Ron Davis, who was a tremendous relief pitcher in '81, had a bad World Series, he's gone. Mickey Dent was having a bad year for the Yankees, and they went out and traded for Roy Smalley. Smalley has ended up playing at third base since he's been over there mostly, but more than likely will become the Yankee shortstop. Talking with Roy before the ball game, he said he loves it in New York. He's over there now only because uh, Greg Nettles hurt his thumb again, the same way he did in the World Series, diving for a ground ball, and he expects to be back in about a week or so. He's taking batting practice tonight before the game, as a matter of fact. Julio Cruz, the second baseman now. Fine little ball player for the Seattle Mariners. Julio, a switch hitter, batting 229 overall and takes a strike. The Yankees have Smalley at third base, Bucky Dent at short, Willie Randolph at second, and John Mayberry at first. Cruz takes outside a ball, one and one. Doyle Alexander. Came from the San Francisco Giants. He had the infield back, and he was going to try to take that one along with him. Mayberry was playing very deep, and so was Randolph. Depending on getting the ball past the pitcher, I would imagine, and trying to outrun the other people. One of the better crowds of the year here in Seattle tonight. Randolph yeah, had a little snow cone show in there, but threw him out, one down. brings on Manny Castillo. It was Alexander who pitched against uh, Seattle in the game where Gaylord won his 299th victory. In these turnaround series that they have in baseball today, for instance, the Mariners were playing in New York last week. And then they have what's called turnaround. The Yankees then come back out here and play. So you see teams twice within a very short period of time, may not see them again for three months or more. So many times you do have the same pitching matchups. Doyle Alexander's a pretty good pitcher, Money. He's bounced around, came over from the San Francisco Giants. He originally came up in the Dodger organization. He was traded to Baltimore for Frank Robinson back in 1971. He throws an off-speed pitch. That's a new pitch for him. He hasn't always had that, and it'll help him. He's gotten two outs with it so far. Both ground balls to Willie Randolph, and now here's Bruce Bakke, the left fielder. That is the most underrated pitch in baseball, and I do not understand why more pitchers don't throw it, the changeup. There are all kinds of different ways to throw the changeup, just to change the speed of what it amounts to. Some people use a spitball, some use a fork ball. Wally, uh, Raleigh Fingers now has picked up a palm ball this year. There are different ways of throwing it. Some just what, throw what they call a straight change. Overgrip the ball, put it back in the hand, and throw it. Pitch outside, ball one. Some even throw it as a screwball. Uh, not right. a good screwball, uh, but a drifting, drifting changeup. a double off the base of the wall in right field. There are two down. Bakke is at second base. It's the Mariners and the New York Yankees here tonight with Gaylord Perry trying for his 300th Major League victory. 
Here's Wes Parker. Bakhti's a good hitter, Money. Lifetime 285 this year, 326, and he hammers this pitch into right center field. The Yankees had a triple with two outs in the first. Now the Seattle Mariners have a double with two outs in the bottom of the first. And Richie Ziss comes on for the Mariners. Richie's the designated hitter for Seattle, and he's batting 301 this year with 10 runs batted in and a couple of homers. These Mariners are really supercharged tonight because they want to win number 300 for Gaylord Perry. The 43-year-old right-handed Carolina farmer. Zisk after an off-speed pitch. Strike one. He's way out front of that one. Doyle Alexander for the Yankees who are on hard times. They are four games under 500 at nine wins, 13 losses. Seattle is three under 500 at 12 wins and 15 losses. Alexander steps off. Big crowd here at the King Dome tonight. Their second biggest of the year, maybe their largest of the year before it's all over. Rick Saron, the Yankee catcher, reminding Alexander, I'm sure, of the signal changes with that runner at second base. Well, since they had the All-Star game here, things have been kind of quiet as far as Seattle baseball is concerned until tonight. And the crowd gave Gaylord Perry an ovation when he went out to warm up, another ovation when he walked out on the field. No score in the game. Zisk takes a pitch in the dirt for a ball. Boy, Alexander, who used to be a hard thrower, fastball slider type pitcher, has now gone to almost using the fastball to set up his off-speed pitch. He doesn't throw many fastballs for strikes. Bruce Bakke shows what, he, what a lot of people do with him when he does. center field hit pretty well but Mumphrey's got it gauged and hauls it in and there are three down in the last half of the first inning one hit and one man left on so here at the King Dome in Seattle it's still nothing and nothing as Gaylord Perry goes to the mound to try to win number 300 tonight <laughs> Keith Hernandez of the St. Louis Cardinals is this week's Player of the Week in the National League. In seven games, Hernandez batted 458 with 11 hits and five RBIs, two of which were game winners, and even stole two bases. The 28-year-old Gold Glove first baseman also played left field, extended his hitting streak to 10 games, and has raised his lifetime average from 299 to 301. First place in eight straight victories for the Cardinals and player of the week for the Redbirds, Keith Hernandez. In the American League, Eddie Murray of the Baltimore Orioles was one of three players to share player of the week honors. The switch hitting first baseman batted 600 for the week and leads the major leagues in hitting. Designated hitter Andre Thornton of the Cleveland Indians hit 480 with nine RBIs. And in the pitching department, rookie Salome Barojas of the Chicago White Sox picked up four saves. Eddie Murray, Andre Thornton, and Salome Barojas, this week's Players of the Week in the American League. This is Warner Fusell with Major League Baseball's Players of the Week. The man going for number 300 tonight, he would be the 15th man in Major League history, should he be able to do it. When he turns around, I want you to take a look at the front bill of his cap, and it'll be the side closest to the camera, the opposite side of what you're looking at right now. You'll see a little white streak right in the front corner. And he might be picking up a little something, something right from that. You can see it right now in the front top bill of his cap, closest to the camera there. See that little white streak? He'll reach up there and touch that. Yes, touch sir. It? See, now he's he even spread it. You can see it better now. That could be some substance right there that he's picking up. We were asking Dave Duncan, the pitching coach of the Seattle Mariners, before the ball game. He's been around the big leagues for a long time. What kind of substance these pitchers today, not just Gaylord, but what are they using? Here's Dave Winfield, powerful left-handed multimillionaire of the Yankees. Our left fielder of the Yankees, and he fouls it off, strike one. Winfield this year hitting 291 with three homers and 16 runs batted in, leading the Yankees in all of that area. Let's put his salary in perspective. If he gets 150 hits this year, he'll be getting paid $10,000 for each hit. Oh, my heavens. You've got it. Thing is, he's going to get paid $10,000 for each hit, whether he gets it or not. <laughs> yeah, you got that, too. <laughs> this is fouled off. Strike two. 
But to pursue that story a little longer about the foreign substance used in the balls, Dave Duncan is one of many who say that a lot of pitchers are using it today, and he says one of the things they're using most could be something that might even have caused that bill to turn white up there. And he said it's common soap right out of the bathroom. He said when soap gets wet, you can put your hand on it. It's the slipperiest thing you can put your hand on today. So a lot of them are putting it uh, on their baseball uniform in different places. And you get your hand wet and touch some soap with it and see how slick it gets. Oh, there it was right there. They use that as the touch point on the ball. And when they release the ball, it comes out with hardly any rotation, which causes a sink. That's basically what the, the foreign substance does to the ball. Now, mind you, we're not saying that Gaylord's throwing that tonight. But if he were, we're pointing out the possible places where it could be. This is something he did himself this year on the NBC television network with Joe Garagiola. Showed all the places he could think of so I could put it. That was a plain old curveball right there, and down goes Winfield. Good off-speed curveball. He just pulls his string on him. And he does this so effectively with most of the hitters that he faces. They're all looking for that fastball. All hitters seem to want a good fastball out over the plate. They sit on it, and if they never see it, it seems like they have a hard time adjusting, and Gaylord Perry will hardly ever throw it to a hitter all night long. Here's Oscar Gamble, one of those left-handed hitters who hasn't produced for the Yankees as yet this year very well. He's batting, as you can see, 115. One run batted in. He's got a lot more pressure on him this year, Monty, because Reggie's gone. And he's supposed to pick up that left-handed power-hitting slack. Also, Greg Nettles is out of the lineup. Off-speed pitch. And that's the football, I believe. That gun, you, you'd almost want to run out down to the Yankee dugout and say, look, guys, you're not going to get a fastball to hit, so sit on an off-speed pitch. But still, they, they can't seem to do it. Gaylord goes through all that, touches his cap, touches his hair forever. Balls hit up into the air in the center field. Gamble was doing just exactly that, but he had to provide all his own power, and he could get it to the warning track, and that's about it. There are two down. And up comes another of the newest Yankees since the season started, Roy Smalley, who is an all-star shortstop for Minnesota. Playing third base for the Yankees now, but you can look for him to be a shortstop before it's all over. Switch hitter batting 224 with a couple of home runs. Boy, did he have a year or two with Minnesota. Playing for a relative of his by the name of Gene Mock. There's the fastball for ball one. Not for a strike. So you see, he does have a fastball, but he's not throwing it for a strike. He just shows it to the hitters. You could almost bet every dollar you have he's going to get an off-speed pitch right now over the plate. A half ball, too. That was another fastball. Two outs and nobody on. Top of the second inning at the Kingdom in Seattle. Monty Moore with Wes Parker. Happy to have you with us tonight, wherever you might be listening in. And winner. This one's liable to be coming back at any hour. Hit hard to right field. And the Mariners get it back in with their second hit of the night. It's going to bring up Rick Cerrone, the Yankee catcher. Rick's hitting 206 with one home run. You notice Simone when the Yankees are getting their hits with two outs. Right. I think Gaylord learned that from Juan Marichal pitching with the Giants. Marichal used to throw 10 and 11 hit shutouts. You just could not believe it. He was so tough with men on base, it was beyond belief. He'd let you get the hits when they when he knew they, they weren't going to hurt him. There's another Carolina farmer of today living in Hertford, North Carolina, by the name of Catfish Hunter, who did a lot of the same kind of thing when he was pitching in the big leagues. Part of it for the Yankees. He was phenomenal. Gave up very few home runs with men on base. Strike. If we used to talk about it, Catfish gave up a lot of home runs, but he pitched a lot of innings per nine innings. He didn't give up any more home runs than a lot of pitchers. And he certainly had a lot more wins than most pitchers. And when the game was on the line, that's not when he gave up the home run. No, sir. Rick Cerrone, a catcher for the Yankees with two out and Smalley at first. Back to the mound and Gaylord. Back hands the ball and throws him out. No runs, one hit and a man left in the middle of the second inning. 
the score is the Yankees nothing and the Mariners nothing. Let's pause now for this message from your local station. USA's coverage of the MISL playoffs 82 gets underway this Sunday as the St. Louis Steamers battle the Wichita Wings in the Western Division. This could very well be the year that the New York Arrows' three-year reign as MISL champions is broken. You won't want to miss the Steamers and the Wings live at 8 p.m. Eastern Sunday on the home of the MISL Championship Series, the USA Cable Network. a great night of professional boxing comes your way on the USA Cable Network next Monday. You won't want to miss a tremendous fight. That card features 1981 amateur heavyweight champion Carl Williams, so be sure to see hard-hitting professional boxing from Madison Square Garden at 8 p.m. Eastern next Monday on your number one channel for primetime Major League Sports, the USA Cable Network. Right there, Jogi Berra. Yogi Berra with his two-way radio, an innovation of the Yankees, talking with someone up in the press box. They moved their outfielders around as a result of somebody being up here. Used to be telephones, Wes, but now they've gone sophisticated. Remember when that caused quite a rhubarb in the World Series? I they certainly had, do. Uh, somebody in the dugout with one of those and... Uh, Money, that man that we were just looking at there, Yogi Berra, I think is the best clutch hitter I ever saw. Boy, was he something probably the best bad pitch hitter you'll ever want to see. Here's Todd Cruz, the shortstop of the Seattle Mariners. Todd's having quite a year. 319 batting average and three home runs. A fine job at shortstop for the Mariners, and Alexander starts him off with a breaking ball outside. The Yankees outfield has Big Dave Winfield in left, Jerry Mumphrey in center, and Ken Griffey in right. There's that off-speed pitch. Well, we got a couple of guys here pitching tonight out of know-how. It's devastating. Absolutely devastating. A great pitch, Money. Every pitcher should have a good changeup. It's not that hard to learn. There's this fastball, and it just missed. Well, if you get up there sitting on one of those off-speed pitches, that one can sneak by you, too. Al Cowan's on deck. Joe Simpson will also bat here in the second inning with no score. Yankees and the Mariners. It's been since 1963. Since anybody won his 300th game in the big leagues. Come on, Detroit, let's go. He's throwing some kind of fork ball or something himself. He had Cruz way out front on the last two swings. It's hard to wait on that junk stuff. Monty, if you just say to yourself, I'm going to go up there and guess off-speed pitch. Just one time. And rip it someplace. Next time up, you'll get your fastball. Here's Al Collins. He's been around a long time in the major leagues. The best years were with Kansas City. a curveball and it's a strike. Yeah. Yankees no runs. They've had a couple of hits. The Mariners no runs. They've had one hit. The Mariners are at home tonight starting an 11 game homestand and they've been tough in the kingdom. very high in the left field and a very high man is after him. Dave Winfield one of the tallest players I guess the tallest player in baseball today. Here's Joe Simpson coming on for the Seattle man. have been tough on the Yankees historically here in uh, the Kingdom. They've played the Yankees 26 times here and have beaten them 17 out of those 26. 
I recall one series up here the Mariners won three games in a row and Steinbrenner flew in and really had himself quite an exciting uh, press conference here accusing the Yankees of not playing all out and that kind of thing. We had him on remember we had George yep. Steinbrenner on as a guest about two years ago I think. And he is a very intense man. That is my one memory of that conversation. And he told it like it was. There's Mailer on deck. Mayberry has got it. And the Yankee first sacker retires the side unassisted. No runs or hits. Nobody left. We play two innings here at the King Dome in Seattle. And the score is nothing, nothing. You're watching Major League Baseball on the USA Network. Sox continue to win. They knocked off the Texas Rangers tonight by a score of five to two. Stanley, the winning pitcher, Honeycutt, the loser. Rice had a homer, and so did Johnson. Well, well, those Red Sox are really doing it, aren't they? They've won something like uh, 17 out of 19. Or? Yeah, they've only lost one or two games, and I think Texas has now lost what 11, 12 in a row. Unbelievable. They're not that bad. Milwaukee beat Minnesota tonight, six to three. No home runs in the ball game. Vukovic, the winner. Here's Bucky Dent, the Yankee shortstop. He rolled for them not many years ago, and I think of Boston, I think of this little guy jerking went up over that screen to put the Yankees in the World Series and one of the most dramatic homers ever hit by a Yankee, and there have been many. For instance, Chris Chambliss against Kansas City. Think of those. But this little guy goes right up there with him because you weren't expecting that one. Up off first base, Mailer's going over there, and in foul territory, says, I got it. And the big guy has. So Gaylord has gone through the Yankee batting order one time and has allowed two hits and no runs. Back to the top, here's Willie Randolph. The second base is number 30, Willie Randolph. This is the 11th game this year Seattle's played at home, and they've won 7 out of 10. series tonight ought to be down in uh, Anaheim California Angels and the Baltimore Orioles Jim Palmer pitching uh, for the Orioles tonight and uh, let's see Porsche is pitching for the Angels good breaking ball strike on the outside corner Gaylord has not come close to walking anybody yet tonight this time last week Wes and I thought we'd be in Anaheim tonight we thought so Tuesday morning. Yeah, as a matter of fact, Tuesday morning we thought we'd be there. <laughs> but here we are in Seattle and glad of it. Pitch outside of ball, one and one. Had a real interesting stat for you. The first six hitters in the Yankee lineup all started their careers in the National League. Randolph with the Pirates, Griffey with Cincinnati, Mumphrey with St. Louis, Mayberry with the Astros, Winfield with the Padres, and Gamble with the Cubs and Phillies. Well, they're not, not many of the Yankees started their careers with the Yankees. Fouled off. So much for the farm systems, huh? Yeah. And the Yankees have traditionally had a pretty good farm system. Of course, with Kansas City was their farm team for a while. Roger Maris yeah. came over and a whole bunch of other people. Yeah, I remember that. Look at Gaylord, always fidgeting. You never know if he's getting something or not. As a hitter, he's got you guessing. something on that one two balls and two strikes there's Renee Latchman the manager of the Seattle Mariners took over one year ago tonight he won his first game 12 to 1 and then ran on to some hard times this year he said his goal was to have the team play respectable baseball for the fans Two offer to the third baseman Castillo and he throws a high tall ball all the way down the line in right field it goes and Randolph goes to second base Watch Gaylord. He used to get very upset when errors were made behind him. So far, he seems to be keeping his cool. But I can remember Monty. He used to stare down his infielders for throwing the ball away like that. I'll tell you what. This is a major league throwaway right here. Maybe took off. I can't really think of a reason why he throws it away because he had plenty of time to set up and make a good throw. He just fires it over the first baseman's head. That's just a plain major league error, folks. You see the umpire jump? Same as first baseman did on that play. They were both trying to catch it. 
Well, Gaylord now has got some work to do. He has two tough left-handed hitters in a row to try to get out and keep that runner at second base. Foul back. Well, you figure that Gaylord will get maybe well, two starts for sure and maybe three on this homestand. And from a financial standpoint, some of the Mariners front office people might just about as soon he didn't get his 300th tonight so he'd get draw that crowd two or three more times he busted that one right by him good fastball kind of like when Hank Aaron was going for his 715th home run I think he went about two weeks before he finally hit it and there was an entourage of press people following him all over the National League well there are people here tonight from the National Networks I saw uh, Dick uh, Schaff here tonight all kinds of people here. Now the way. No balls and two strikes on Griffey with potential run scoring man at second. And you can bet that if, Gay if Gaylord can get any kind of an edge on a pitch or two here, he's going to get it. See what Griffey's doing here. He's waiting a lot better than the first time around, first time up. And Gaylord's going more to hard stuff this time because he sees him waiting on the pitches better. the base hit and the air is going to cost Seattle Cow and throw is to the plate to hold him back it didn't cost him yet I just started to mention that Cowens has got one of the great arms and when you're playing on artificial surface that one hopper you throw from the outfield picks up speed on the hop and really gets into the plate in a hurry so now Gaylord could get out of this with a double play and he's got a pitch to Jerry Mumphrey who has pretty good speed if they'll send Griffey here or not. Uh, Ken has stolen over 30 bases in, in at least one season. He's got excellent speed. Of course, you've got a hole there for the left-handed hitter to hit through, too. Mariners have their infield of Cruz and Cruz, second and third, second and short, backed up there. They're in what we call double play position here, hoping to get two. And there's it. Set up the double play and Gaylord pitched it right in there. No runs, one hit, one error, and one left. After two and a half innings, there's no score. Let's pause for this message from your local station. League is Barry Bunnell with Toronto. He's having a sensational year hitting 415. Looking at the top 10 hitters over there, Eddie Murray is having a fan, just a fine year for Baltimore, 376. Toby Hare of Cleveland, Richie Dower of Baltimore, came out of the LA area, went to USC. He's having a fine season, 367. And then Jim Sunberg, the fine catcher for Texas at 366. Some of the other hitters, Buddy Bell went four for four yesterday. He's up to 354. I think he is just one fine all-around ball player, Buddy Bell. We used to watch his dad play Gus Bell. And then Tom Peshark traded over to the White Sox, 353. Also having a fine year. We mentioned there was a little bit of press coverage here tonight for the 300th victory possibility for Gaylord. There's just a look at some of the local people who come in here from all over. That man with the red shirt on, or red sweater on, is our guy. No, it isn't. It's the one behind him. And the white shirt is ours. We have a bunch of them around here. We're in the last half of the third inning, and here's Jim Mailer, a powerful first baseman for the Seattle Mariners. Mailer this year has hit three home runs. Boy, Dave Kingman of the Mets is really having a year. He got his ninth home run tonight against the Giants. But the Mets still lost. Giants beat them 5-3. to three. Minton was the winner over Orozco. And by the way, Minton threw his first run ball in 290 something innings the other day and the longest streak in major league history with a pitcher not allowing a home run that ball is hit pretty well in the alley to left center field Humphrey's back in the warning track and can't get it it's off the top of the wall Mayer's rounding second he's on his way to third and he 
got it standing up. Well, we said the powerful first baseman, and let me tell you, he just missed the home run with that, baby. Just by inches, Monty, this game has turned around in a hurry with the double play, and now a leadoff triple by Jim Muller. Looked like an off-speed pitch. Somebody tipped him off because he waited well on it. The ball's up a little bit. Sinking fast. Now, he hits it pretty well. Watch how close this thing comes to going out. And you're going to see a great backup play by Dave Winfield. I think it hit the yellow. Humphrey was out of the play at that point. And look at Winfield come over. He might have saved an inside-the-park home run. Absolutely. That's all you have to play on these uh, artificial surfaces. Humphrey, that time, I believe, thought he had a chance to catch the ball. He was so close to the wall that he never would have caught the carom. The Yankees are going to give up a run here to get an out. They've got their infield back. And Bulling takes a shot at it and fouls it off, strike one. But Bulling, the catcher. But batting at even 300, he's only been up 20 times. Boy, this is a, the spot where every hitter who likes RBIs likes to be in because all you got to do is hit a ground ball a short or second, and you've got an RBI. Scoreless game. Off the stretch. Ball's fouled off. Bowling didn't wait on that one very well. He's behind in the count, 0-2 now. This is where you hit to a situation. This is called situation hitting right here, Monty. To try and hit that ground ball to second to short, or at least get a fly ball to the outfield. You can't overswing. You have to have an idea in your mind and execute. Now, as slow as Mailer is, if that ball is hit right straight at uh, the shortstop, for instance, even though he's back, he may take a shot at the plate because Mailer's not that fast, and then if he charges the ball, could throw him out. Hit foul. This is the case also where the coach, Chuck Cottier, I'm sure, told Mailer, if that ball's hit on the ground, make sure it goes through before you go to the plate because there's nobody down. On deck, Julio Cruz is waiting to get a pop at it. A lot of off-speed pitches. In fact, nothing but so far. Look out, fastball. Any minute now. Right off the leg of the pitcher in the center field, and the Mariners lead one to nothing. But pulling with a sizzling shot to center. Off Alexander's leg, and Doyle's got to be lucky he didn't get hurt on that one. Boy, Doyle Alexander was trying to set him up, Bunny, for a fastball. And he never, you never really know if you've got the guy set up or not, but he tries to zip a fastball by him, and Bulling is right on it. Drills it hard off that astroturf, and Doyle Alexander just can't quite react in time. Yeah, it hit off his glove, not his leg, as it turns out. Cruz bunts at the ball, and that was a feeble attempt at a bunt. I don't mind telling you. Where did all the bunters go? <laughs> that, if that was an attempt at a sacrifice bunt, he didn't go to the school <laughs> for bunting very long, or flunked out. And here's a leadoff man. There's he one. ought to be able to bunt. You're right. There's one down there uh, with the Angels who can bunt, Rod Carew. Who else? Uh, He's mastered that art. One to nothing, the Mariners and Gaylord Perry are leading the Yankees. Now that's a good bunt. He got out in front of that one, and he throws it all the way. Going to third is Bulling, and they're going to stop him right there. Rick Cerrone took a look at second, but he saw that Bulling had it made there, and he turned and fired to first about the time Cruz got there. not getting the best of support right here. I don't know yet on whom they're going to call that error. I think it's on the catcher. I think he threw it into the baseline, Monty. It's a, it's a good bunt. For some reason, Cerrone hesitated. Now, he's forced to really hustle his throw. Even if he makes a perfect throw, he might not get him. It's too close at this point. Goes off the first baseman's glove. Or, excuse me, that's really Randolph covering. This has been killing the Yankees. Little mistakes. Castillo after a pork ball and missing. That's a sacrifice bunt. No at bat and an error allowing the runner to get there and the error will be on the catcher. Where they got into a little trouble, they not only had Randolph over there, but Mayberry was also cluttering up the act at first base. Still nobody out and the top of the order's up. 
Nice block by Cerrone. I think it was the umpire. I don't, it doesn't matter now. They, they stopped it. The ball was stopped, but the Yankees, in talking to Lou Pinello before the game, honey, he said that the Yankees have been making a lot of little mistakes, especially on defense. And that's usually just a lack of concentration. Somebody's got to light a fire under those guys. Well, they also mentioned that one of the reasons is they never have the same infield. Guys are coming to the park and don't know who's going to play where. That's true. There's a little pop-up on the infield, right up behind the infield. Dent cannot get it. A run scores, and they're going to try another one. Now he goes back. Julio Cruz took a big turn around third, drew the throw away from the cutoff man, allowing Bakke to take, or not Bakke, but Castillo to take second base. And I don't mind telling you, the Seattle ball club is showing some excellent base running here. They're fired up. These guys, this is one of the biggest games, maybe the biggest game the Seattle ball club has ever played. They're playing it like a World Series game. And you're going to see some good base running here. The ball was not hit hard, but the infield was playing in. It drops in. Now Winfield fires the ball home, and that's because Cruz came way around the third base bag, and the minute that throw came through, what happens? Manny Castillo went all the way to second base, so it's second and third. And still nobody out. And still nobody up in the Yankee bullpen. And here is Bruce Bakke at the plate. And the Yankee infield is still back. They're down two to nothing, and they're still playing back. So that means they'll give up another run on an infield roller if it happens like that. Boy, he had a cut. Bakhti got a double in the first inning. Julio Cruz at third base, and he can pick him up and lay him down. Boy, did he go around the bases. Castillo at second, and he did the same. Where the infield is playing give you an idea if the ball's hit to the third baseman of course the runner at third if he does right won't go if it's hit to short or second he's got to go and with that fast runner cruise at third there's no way Denton will even think about throwing the ball home just missed inside at the Seattle Kingdom USA Network Baseball. Next Thursday night, the Yankees again. They play the Oakland A's in Oakland. I'm looking forward to that one. Popped up off third base. They got a lot of room to roam in foul territory here. And Smalley makes a catch. Throws it back uh -huh. into the infield. The pitcher was where he was supposed to be, but I'll tell you, if you short hop a guy on this artificial surface, you're doing him an injustice. Smalley really didn't have to throw that ball. Yeah. Wasn't that far down the line. I think he looked up and saw the Seattle coach, Chuck Cottier, way down towards home and thought he was a runner. He made a fine catch of that foul ball. And here's Richie Zisk. Zisk lined out center field his first time up. The Mariners are leading 2-0 for Gaylord Perry in quest of his 300th Major League victory. You brought up a good point. That Yankee infield is still playing back, which means they're willing to give up another run, a third run. Yeah, they think they're going to score a lot of runs off Gaylord. That's all it, all it amounts to. That's right. It really surprises me. The way they've been going, ordinarily a team in a slump will come in. And of course, if it's a bad slump, then somebody will dump one over their head. <laughs> and they'll get two runs instead of the one they're going to give up. But that's you, just the way they play it. I tell you, Cerrone just made a sensational play. Going to his right. Digging that ball out of the dirt. Alexander's made him work. Another. He's throwing that ball over. That's a screwball, I'm sure now. I've been watching to see what he does, and he definitely rolled the wrist inside out. He's throwing a screwball. No wonder it's so hard to control. Mariners have had three hits here in the inning. They almost dehorn Cruz at third base. <laughs> Boy, did he take one close. Look at that. That's where it went, right over his head. <laughs> that little over-the-shoulder look at the hitter. I love that. That said it all. <laughs> Richie Zisk, two balls and one strike count. Alexander off the stretch. He hit the inside corner with a pitch Zisk was not looking for, for sure. 
they get her like this, all he's got to do is hit one off the fist and get it rolling on that infield to get a run in. Deep as small he's playing, they could score a run even on a grounder to third here. Screwball, he struck him out. Big, big pitch right there. Now it'll take the hit. Really too big a swing by this With two strikes, he should try to shorten up that stroke and just make contact. He's just such an all-out home run hitter. It's hard for him to do that. And it was a good pitch. You don't see many screwballs thrown by right-handed pitchers to right-handed hitters. And Jess definitely got fooled on that one. Now here's Todd Cruz. Same pitch. And he's out in front. He struck Cruz out on three straight his first time up tonight. That's four straight he swung at and missed. Bonnie, this is where hitters have to start using their head, not just go up there and swing. They've got to start thinking, that's four. I should look for one now. Yeah, he's going to throw it until you show you can, you can hit it. There's another one. He had a better cut at it anyway. Strike two. Julio Cruz at third base. He was there with nobody down. Manny Castillo at second, and he was there with nobody down. Alexander got Bakhti to pop up and Zisk to strike out. Screwballs, he didn't come close to hitting it. He tries to sneak a fastball by him, face hit. That could cost him the ball game right there. Well, listen, you don't sneak fastballs by hitters who are looking bad at screwballs. That's right. They're sitting there hoping you throw a fastball, when you, especially when you don't throw it any faster than Alexander does. Here's Collins. Takes outside, ball one. Had the count 0 and 2 and fed him a fastball. That was really, the, really stupid. Same thing to Bud Bowling. He had him one ball, two strikes, and tried to throw a fastball by him and hit it right up the middle on him. I'm always reminded of that Ted Williams quote that pitchers are dumb. <laughs> Not all the time, but sometimes they are. Well, if you're going to throw a fastball on an 0 2 count to a guy like that, you don't throw it for a strike. Boy, that was a big base hit. And what a job Cruz has done this year for them in the RBI column. That's 10 RBIs for Todd. He's the American League Player of the Week one week this year. Strike called now, Collins. Ball then, but it was way outside. Philadelphia beat San Diego tonight, 12 to seven. Christensen, the winner over Eichelberger. Boy, that San Diego's played some great baseball this year. Good job by Dick Williams. Well, I'll say, and that's not surprising to me. Misses low. It's three and one. And now, if you're Al Kind, you're looking for that fastball. But against this guy, I don't know if you'll get it. This is the eighth man to bat in the third inning for the Mariners. to work for the Yankees. 
The horse may be out of the barn by the time they get the gate closed tonight. He drilled it right up the alley, and both those men can run. Todd Cruz at first base, they never had a chance at him. Cowan's really motored to make it a triple. He runs very well. That's Willie Randolph with the relay throw, not even nearly in time. Roy Smalley taking it. Boy, the Yankees really look flat, Money, and I don't think it's just because of Doyle Alexander. They just don't look like they've got that spark going. There's Rudy May. You know, I asked Luke Pinella before the game about the loss of Reggie Jackson and the fact that he's been let go as a free agent, whether he thought that made any difference. And Lou said, I don't really think we miss his bat, Wes, but what we do miss is just the charisma that he added to this ball club. He was an inspiration to all the other players. I think he was kind of the glue. But like he said, the straw that stirred the drink. Here's Joe Simpson, runner third and two down. That was pitching coach uh, Stan Williams who went out and talked to... Uh, Alexander Williams came when uh, Michaels came. Part of Michael's deal was that he was able to have uh, Stan Williams as his pitching coach. Jerry Walker, the man we talked about, who took the mound in the 300th victory for uh, early win, was the pitching coach. And there's the last out. Nine men came to the plate. Five of them scored. Five of them had hits. There was one error and a man left. And after three innings, the Mariners are leading the Yankees five zip. MISL semifinals last year. Emilio John's shootout goal gave the St. Louis Steamers a thrilling 8-7 victory over the Wichita Wings, earning the Steamers a trip to the MISL championship. And now the Wings have a chance to get even. The Orange Army will be ready for game two of the MISL semifinals as the powerful St. Louis Steamers cruise into Wichita to battle the high-flying Wings. It all begins at 8 p.m. Eastern Sunday on the home of the MISL championship series, the USA Cable Network. Yeah. All right, we can handle it. How close is the hockey game to being over? Paid for the pound, those two guys right there be making a lot of money because that's a couple of big guys right there. John Mayberry, who just joined the Yankees today, and Dave Winfield standing in the on deck circle. They'll be the first two batters here in the inning, and I believe that is Jim Perry with the gray hair. Uh, no, no, on the far right yeah, hand side. Jim, the yeah, with the sweater, with the sweater, on. sweater right. That's Jim Perry. And Jim won 215 games in the major leagues. Gaylord going for number 300. That's a total of 514 before tonight, and that's the most by any two brothers in Major League history. Even better than Dizzy and Dazzy. All right, here we go to the fourth inning. John Mayberry. Newest Yankee popped up to short his first time at the plate. Gaylord Perry has given up three hits tonight. There's a curve in there for a call strike. there will be cause for playing of that song celebration here tonight if Gaylord can hang on. Five nothing lead. He's got a pretty good chance. He's outside a ball. I'll tell you about all he's got to do is hang on for two more innings. Just don't get hurt out there. It takes five innings to get a win in the major leagues when you start the game. Knowing him, he's going to want to go longer than that. Even it gets a little shaky. Well, he's made five starts this year. This is start number six. And in each of those five starts, he has gone at least into the seventh inning. There's the big guy, Winfield. And Michael standing right behind him. He turned sideways, you couldn't see him. We call him a stick. Mayberry. Who... <laughs> What'd you say, Gene? That's just what I thought you said. <laughs> oh, poor Gene. He's he looks like he has aged a little bit. 
That must be hard over there. Manager, not manager, manager again. He was going to be the manager next year. There's the sinker. The super slick sinker. And Mayberry goes down. Oh, he's got it going tonight, doesn't he? Oh, my goodness. That, I tell you, Money, there's, there's nobody alive that could have hit that pitch. Oh, did that thing go down? Here comes Winfield. He struck out his first time up. Now, obviously, we have seen the end of Doyle Alexander tonight. The Yankees have Rudy May throwing in the bullpen again. off his glove. Cruz may have a chance. Look at that arm. He got him. Man, that guy can throw the baseball. Taylor Perry gets a an assist here because if he hadn't touched the ball, it's up the middle for a base hit. He deflects it towards short. Cruz out of the Philadelphia Phillies organization, and he does have a great arm. He's a fine shortstop. He's having a great year. He's hitting 315, I believe, coming into this ball game. 319. Two down, and here's Oscar Gamble. And again, the Seattle Mariners infield is almost out of your out of they are out of your sight right there on the screen, and they're almost out of sight of everybody. These left-handed batters are played very, very deep on this carpet. Curve in there for a call strike. And it's a good thing they were against Winfield, the uh, right-handed hitter then in Mayberry. Look at there. He is behind the shortstop is well behind that circle. And look where the second baseman is. He's a good 15 feet behind what would be the infield cutout on a dirt field. Gamble hits in the air in the left center. And Bakhti closes the gap and puts the squeeze on it. Three up, three down, and Gaylord moves another step closer to number 300. After three and one half innings of play, the score is 5 0 Seattle. Let's pause for this message from your local station. Next Saturday, as USA brings you a live NHL NBA playoff doubleheader, first will continue TV's most extensive coverage of the Stanley Cup playoffs as the New York Islanders host Vancouver, and that's in game number one. Then it's showdown 82 as the San Antonio Spurs battle the LA Lakers in game number one or two of that series. Don't miss this night of playoff excitement beginning live at 8 p.m. Eastern. That's next Tuesday on the USA Cable Network. We saw San Antonio right here in this ballpark last night. Uh, Wes uh, knock off the Seattle Mar uh, Seattle uh, Seahawks. No, not the Seahawks. What are this basketball team? Seattle what? Sonics. What am I thinking about? A lot of teams around today. Yeah, right here last night. They played that game, and it was on the USA Network. It's going to be interesting to see if the layoff will hurt the Lakers. They swept their series in four straight over Phoenix, and now they've got to just sit around for a week before they play their next game. Oh, my goodness. Look at here. West Stock, Jeff Stock, whole bunch right here. Good to see you, partner. Hey, here's a guy. Here, West Stock has just walked in our booth. Pitching coach for a long time in the big leagues. Now television broadcaster I put a note on his door down in Anaheim the other day he didn't he was gone already I said if you can become an announcer I can become a pitching coach <laughs> <laughs> yeah and his son uh, who is with him here tonight is on a lot of our USA soccer telecast West because he is a starting striker is it fullback for the uh, Seattle uh, soccer team up here good to see you guys Bad knee. All right, here we go now in the last yeah. half of the fourth inning. And Mailer, who started that melee back in the third inning with a triple, faces Rudy May and takes low for ball one, one and oh. Right on the fist, he hit him with the pitch and is fouled off. Alexander had a terrible third inning. Brought in from the outside, right over the corner, for a strike. Yeah. 
just missed outside with a fastball. Let up on him and Mailer goes down swinging. So Rudy May strikes out the first man he faces in the ball game. Brings up Bud Bulling who hit a rocket shot right up the middle off Alexander to drive in the first round of the ball game in the third inning. It is five to nothing. Hard breaking pitch down and in, ball one. and no strikes. Well, it was a beautiful day in this part of the country today. Many times you come up here and find a lot of fog and cold. And the kind of weather today was gorgeous. There's a hot smash to short. And Bucky Dan has all the time in the world to throw him out and does just that. Two down. Back to the top of the batting order for Hoot Leo Cruz as you take a close look at Bucky Dent. You wonder how much shortstop he'll be playing for the Yankees when Greg Battles gets back as a third baseman. He'll play somewhere. If it's not with Seattle, somebody will like him. Or not with the Yankees. Cruz after the Rudy May fastball. There's Renee Latchman. Skipper of the Mariners. People always ask me, why do ball players spit? I can't yep. answer that question. I really can't, but I did the same thing when I was playing. I know why he's spitting, because he's got a mouthful of tobacco you don't want to leave in your mouth just to get rid of it. You know, one thing is you don't have anything to eat until after, well, 3 o'clock is usually about the time you eat before the game, and now it's, uh, what, almost, well, 8.45, so that's a long time. Five hours later, you got nothing in your stomach. Rudy thought he had him struck out with that curveball. He missed with it one and two. Yeah, I think the close-up pictures of Reggie Jackson during the World Series have proclaimed him the all-time world champion spitter. <laughs> <laughs> of spits per minute. Breaking ball right in on him. Boy, Rudy's one of the left-handed pitchers in baseball that'll come right into the wheelhouse of a right-handed hitter, but he's got so much confidence with that curveball that he'll just throw it right in there on you. It's tough to keep it fair. Well, oh, he's pitched some awfully good games in his big league career. Sort of turned that one over and Cruz fouled it off. Quite a career, too. He's been with California for many years before he came over to the Yankees. Then he went to Baltimore, Montreal, and back to the Yankees. Started pitching in 1965 with the California Angels. got him. Three up, three down here in the fourth inning. No runs, hits, or errors. Nobody left on. And after four innings of play here at the Kingdom in Seattle, the score is the Mariners five and the Yankees nothing. All right. Great to see you. everybody who's been watching the hockey playoff tonight. This is Monty Moore along with Wes Parker, and we're at the Seattle Kingdom for a momentous occasion. And it is made even more so in as much as that score shows the Seattle Mariners are leading the New York Yankees five to nothing. And the Mariners are leading it for Gaylord Perry, who is trying tonight to get his 300th Major League victory and become only the, 40, the 15th man in the history of the game to get it. You're looking at the kingdom there. They have one of the big message boards here, and they flash the film on there of different plays of baseball that are fun and so forth. We showed it to you last week. And there's a sign that tells the whole story here tonight. Get number 300 at home. And if Gaylord Perry, the Carolina farmer, can come through here tonight, there will be some celebration. His wife, Blanche, is here. His brother, Jim, is here. His uh, teenage daughter, one of his teenage daughters, is here tonight. But the other teenage daughter is back in Carolina. It's prom night for her and her brother, and her brother has a baseball game back there, so he couldn't be here for the occasion, or they might all have been here. But even the governor of uh, Washington is here tonight, John Spellman. 
Hall of Fame catcher Earl Averill. They're all here tonight. But mainly, we're glad you're here. And we're ready to go to the top half of the fifth inning. And here is Wes Parker for the play-by-play. -play. And here is Roy Smalley hitting seventh in the Yankee order, playing third base tonight. Greg Nettle is injured with that bad thumb again. He ought to be back in about a week, and the Yankees need him. Smalley way out in front of an off-speed pitch. Gaylord Perry has been pretty much in control. The one bad spot he had was in the top of the third inning. The score was nothing-nothing. Randolph was safe on a two-base error by third baseman Manny Castillo, and then Griffey singled to right. They held Randolph a third. The Yanks had first and third one out. Next pitch from Gaylord Perry was grounded into a double play by Jerry Mumphrey. Then in the bottom half of that same inning, Seattle came up with five runs. They sent nine men to the plate, got five hits, and they lead it five to nothing. We're in the top half of the fifth inning. One ball, one strike count to Roy Smalley. Pulls that one foul. Smalley and Butch Weiniger were the two high-priced players on the Minnesota Twins ball club, and Cal Griffith decided that he didn't want that big salary, and he wanted to go with a lot of young players. As you remember, we had the Twins on earlier this year. They started six rookies right here against Seattle, and Smalley was traded away to the Yankees, and for a while, it looked like Cal Griffith was going to try to trade Butch Weiniger, his all-star catcher. So far, he hasn't. That's a fly ball to center field. Simpson is drifting over. And he puts that one away. So that's the first out of the fifth inning. Two more outs, and Gaylord Perry will be officially the pitcher in this game to stand or to win or lose it. Rick Cerrone, the catcher, is a hitter. He's only hitting 206 on the year. Granted, back to the mound his first time up. He's down to 203. The Yankees have really had their problems getting started this year. Four games under 500 after losing in the World Series in six games to the Dodgers. And the Yanks have really traded away a lot of their power for speed. And of course, Reggie Jackson, now with California, the free agent route. And that represented a lot of power right there. Chopper in front of the plate, foul ball. But the thing that really surprised me was, was when the Yankees got rid of Bob Watson. Watson, a lifetime 300 hitter. He's now playing for Atlanta. That was in a trade for a minor league pitcher out of the Atlanta Braves organization. Watson had a super World Series. One final we didn't give you yet in the National League, the Dodgers, in an afternoon game, defeated Montreal 3-2. to two. Winning pitcher once again was Jerry Royce. He is having a fine season. Boy, is he ever. He's almost unhittable in every game we've seen. He's about the best left-hander in baseball, or at least in the National League. Carlton's off to a slow start, and Valenzuela's off to a fairly slow start. That pitch just outside. Oh, in for a strike. One ball, two strikes. Some of the magic of Valenzuela was uh, somewhat distorted. They only had 36,000 the last game he pitched at home, and that's the smallest crowd ever since he's been starting. Well, it rained all that day, too. That might be partly it. Good off-speed pitch. Gaylord Perry is a masterful pitcher as opposed to a thrower. Watch this pitch now. Does that ball sink a little bit or not? He hit that corner, too. There's the look of an intense man right there. Good follow through. And Bucky Dent, or Rick Cerrone takes a hike. Here comes Bucky now. Bucky popped up the first, first time up. Came into this game hitting 182, and he's down to 178 right now. Boy, oh, Gaylord is something, isn't he? He makes it look so easy, Money. He hasn't even been behind the batter tonight. In his 20th year in the major leagues, and all those years of experience are paying off for him tonight. He has really made some outstanding pitches, and he's kept the ball down for all five innings. The Yankees have two outs, nobody on, and their ninth hitter in the lineup, Bucky in at the plate. They're trailing five to nothing. And 
that's hit into left field. Rocky's right there. That'll do it. The Yankees go one, two, three in the top half of the fifth. After four and a half innings of play now, the score is Seattle five, New York nothing. Let's pause for this message from your local station. An exciting evening here at the Kingdom of Seattle. That's the Washington Husky Band here tonight. They and their pom-pom girls or dancers have been putting on a fantastic show prior to the game, during the game. And it's just uh, an exciting atmosphere for Gaylord Perry in his quest for number 300. Wes Parker is our play-by-play -play man on the USA Network this part of the ball game. I'm Monty Moore. We've been joined now by Wes Stock, who for many years was a pitcher in the American League, a premier reliever, then a pitching coach and one of the best ever, and now he's telecasting for the Seattle Mariners and got I hung up the suitcase. Well, let's get in here, Wes. How you doing? Well, real good. Of course, you know, I'm still a Seattle fan, of course, being the pitching coach here for five years. There's a shot. That's deep to left. And big Dave Winfield, all 6'6 six, six of them, puts that one away. That was Manny Castillo hit the first pitch from Rudy May for the out. I want to ask you one thing, Wes. You pitched against Gaylord many times. What do you think are the qualities that have brought him to this moment tonight? Well, I think because, you know, number one, he's a great, great competitor. He just doesn't give up. In the game that he won in New York, and he won his 299, we had a big press conference afterwards. Even 15 minutes afterwards, he was still huffing and puffing. He knew that he'd given everything that he had. And I think he's just a master of the game, and he pitches as a, he knows what he wants to throw and has great command. And you got all three of those things without having, never having a sore arm. This is why he's here tonight getting number 300. Bruce Bakhti, the hitter for Seattle. We're in the bottom half of the fifth inning. Seattle leads 5-0, one out, nobody on. Bakhti has doubled and popped out to third. He's one for two, and he hits a shot down to third, bobbled momentarily by Smalley, still gets him. Good recovery by Roy Smalley down there at third. And that'll bring up Richie Zist, the DH. Here's Smalley, and you can tell a guy who's not a natural third baseman. He went after that ball. You didn't see it right there. He didn't go after it backhand. Most third soccer reach across, and he got in front of it like a shortstop would almost. He showed a good arm, though, throwing a long ways across the diamond. Richie Zisk is lined out to center and struck out. I did acquisition right there. Smalley looks like a pretty good deal for New York now because at the time there was a few players upset, but he's really going to help them now with Nettles out. Wes, do you have any ideas why the Yankees look like they're almost lethargic? I don't know. I don't, you know, they, they're they kind of, kind of a, I guess, I don't know, but they look like they're a little bit confused ball club, and I don't know reason why. Oh, there's a drive deep to left center field. Way back, they're going to play it off the wall. It's going to bounce into center. And once again, Winfield's over there to hold it this time to a double. Well, you've got to have the left fielder back up the center fielder in the center field here in this ballpark. And take a look at this. The see where Winfield right now is striding real long to get over behind it. It hit on that artificial surface track and bounced right over the head of Mumphrey, and Winfield really kicks it in. Now, if he doesn't get this ball, that's a triple. But he got it right there, and it's a double. Boy, Jerry Mumphrey's having a tough time playing that left center field fence. That's twice the ball's bounced over his head. It happened with Jim Muller in the third inning when he got a triple. I think when they put this new wall in right field, I think that's going to make a lot more balls and a lot more excitement where balls have been home runs before are going to come back onto the playing field. And I think this is where it makes excitement. You've got to have some guys in the outfield that can go chase the ball. What about this fellow right here, Todd Cruz? He wasn't hitting this high in the lineup early in the season, I don't believe. And now he's hitting 319 coming into this game. He's one for two with a couple of RBIs. He's been outstanding. I mean, he's hit the ball hard. I mean, not easy, but he's got some big base hits, and like you like at the one he got tonight, but in Baltimore in the seventh or eighth inning, he got a key base hit that got the rally going to come back and to beat Baltimore, and he's just been outstanding. He's done everything that they asked for him. Of course, the main reason they got him was defense, but they sure didn't think he was going to hit the ball like he's been hitting it, and of course, they're hoping that he can keep going. He's got a good basic swing, and he's an outstanding fielder as well. That pitch down in the dirt. You know, early in the season, there was a, he got taken out of a few ball games and really got disturbed over it, and of course, uh, 
there's that new wall out there. It, it, where the yellow line is down low is where the fence used to go all the way across. Now they've put it, made it playable by going 23 feet high all the way around, sort of a miniature Fenway Park. One ball, two strike pitches, swung on and missed. Cruz was hitting ninth in the lineup two weeks ago. Now he's moved up to fifth, but he strikes out here. So at the end of five complete now, it is still five to nothing. Seattle leaves one. And we'll turn it over right now. You're listening to the USA Cable Network. Nothing Seattle. I'm Wes Parker along with Monty Moore and our guest in the box with us here is Wes Stock who's now a broadcaster telecaster for the Seattle Mariners. Wes what about the heart of Gaylord Perry? Isn't that guy a competitor? It's just unbelievable what he does. You know he just goes out there and he believes that he can win yet and he can believe he can go out there and pitch nine innings and I say he's done an outstanding job since he's came here. He's just been unbelievable. He hasn't been a four or five inning or six inning pitcher a lot of people. He's an eight and nine inning pitcher. Have you ever seen a guy who hated more for a manager to come out and take the ball out of his hand? <laughs> Yes, Boy. he hates that. And, of course, there's one incident that I'll bring up a little bit later here. All right, there's a curveball down in the dirt. Al Cowens will be leading off for Seattle at top, the bottom half of this inning. But right now, there's Willie Randolph. Randolph, who came over from the Pittsburgh Pirates. He's in his seventh year with the New York Yankees. Curveball in for a strike. What's the story? It was in New York, and of course, I think it was uh, two outs in the ninth inning, and a Latch came out the mound, and he just says, Gator, he says, I, I think I gotta get that hard thrower out there and bring him in. And Gator looked at him, and he says, You know what, Skip? I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> he brought in Cottle, and of course, he got out Davy Collins. Yeah, that was his last start, win number 299. Misses with a fastball. Have you noticed how he's been keeping the ball down all night tonight? He does. He, I tell you, he really concentrates on keeping the ball down. Like he says, he said, if I make mistakes, I know I'm not going to win. He said, I got to go out there and make the pitches that's going to make me. And he said, I know they're going to hit the ball. He said, that's why I want guys to be defensive ball players behind me and do the best job they can do. And he really stresses that. Two balls, one strike. Randolph takes that one up high. One West Parker. West Stock was with the Oakland A's in 1974 when a young player by the name of Claudio Washington was brought up out of the minor leagues, the double-A league for the Oakland A's ball club. And Gaylord Perry had a string going where he'd won 15 straight games in the American League and needed one game more to set the American League record for most consecutive wins. I'll tell you about it in a minute. Strike two, three balls, two strikes. Willie Randolph leading off here in the top of the sixth. And Gaylord came with Cleveland. There was a huge sellout. Uh, at the Oakland Coliseum to see it, and a young player by the name of Claudel Washington hit two triples against him that night and beat him. West, you remember that in extra innings? Remember very well. In fact, the last time up, I think he kind of hit the ball to left center. He's a left hand hitter, but still hit the ball the other way. Look at him move around. Perry falling off to the first base side. He really recovered well to get that swinging bunt from Randolph and throw him out. Well, we've taken a look tonight once or twice at the cap of the bill of the cap on Gaylord. Wes Parker is pointing out to those of us, uh, to those who were with us earlier, that there's a little discoloration right on the right-hand side of the bill of his cap. And we'll take a look at that here in a minute as Ken Griffey comes up. Here's Ken Griffey hitting second in the lineup. He's off to a very slow start, 239, and he's a lifetime 300 hitter. In fact, 307 as a result of all those good years he had over at Cincinnati. That one deep, but it's going to go foul. Lands in the, well, I guess you'd call it the second deck here. He really hit it. Went about 15, 20 feet foul. But you're talking about that discolor in the hat. One of the writers in New York had asked Gaylord, he says, do you think they should legalize the spitter? He says, I wish they would. That'd give me another pitch. Yeah. <laughs> Look, now there, look on the right side of the bill of his cap. Now, he's always going with his thumb, and he touches the bill of the cap right there and has so much perspiration on his hands and so forth that the bill of that cap is, now this one may sink. It did sink a dab. But he goes up there on the cap, and as they say, uh, the pitching coach of the Mariners, Dave Duncan, was telling us earlier tonight they could put soap. They, could, they use soap today on that kind of thing. They use different kinds of jellies and Vaselines and so forth. I think there's so many ways now that if you want to, I guess if you want to try that. It's... Well, it looks the way he sweats, it's like he could touch any part of his body and get some moisture at least. And I think a lot of it has a mental effect on the hitters too. That's right. Thinking about, you know yourself, Wes, as That's a hitter, right. you start thinking about those things. And... 
Murphy looks at the two strike pitch up and in. So it's one ball, two strikes, one out, nobody on. Seattle leads at five nothing. Just shows you so much of this game is mental anyway, and of course you get something like that bothering a hitter out there. And some hitters, I think it disturbs more than other hitters. Jerry Mumphrey, the on-deck hitter, who you looked at. Now he's got a one-ball, two-strike count. Let's see if he mentally throws one sinker here. <laughs> Let's see how mental this pitch is going to be. <laughs> Was that mental? Look at that thing go down. <laughs> Fair ball. Griffey now tries to run, but they'll get him easily at first. That ball just buried in the ground right in front of first base. They hit right it right on the, the top. No play. <laughs> what's called killing worms. Now they're going to appeal to the third base umpire who may call it a foul ball. Well, the umpire, the home plate umpire there, that is Ken Kaiser. He's pointing to the spot where the ball buried in the dirt right in front of home plate. And George Maloney out there, the third base umpire who came down and let's see if Ken Kaiser wants any help. Well, he's right. There's no doubt about it. It's a fair ball. Look at this. I don't know why that ball's stuck in there like that. Somebody watered down the dirt. Look at that. Well, it might have been so wet on the ball. Now they're going to, uh, the third base umpire is calling it a foul. And he's going to get another chance. Renee Latchman talking to Kaiser. Wes, I don't think no matter where it hits in foul or fair territory, as long as it ends up in fair territory is what it counts as where it's going to be fair or foul. Right. Now, if it hit the, uh, if the they runner. Touched it, if yeah. they touched it in foul territory, the catcher got on that ball in a hurry. If he touched it in foul territory, it's foul ball. One thing I'm thinking, it hit in uh, fair territory, bounced back and hit the catcher and then went back out. But it didn't. It didn't do that? That ball absolutely there buried it right where it hit the ground is where it stayed. Now, watch it sink. This is what's interesting. Look at that ball stick. You ever seen that? I've, I've been around this game for 20 years. I've never seen that I'm happen. Not there either. That ball did not move. It was in. Kicked the helmet, kicked the ball again. All of a sudden, Grimmie decided that very look at Gaylord. He's standing there watching this whole thing. I don't understand that, Wes. I can't quite. Well, I, I think we can understand it better when we realize that Gaylord Perry's a low ball sinker pitcher. And I think somebody might have put some moisture on that dirt area in front of the plate. Ball's hit hard. That may be out of here. Way back. That's gone. Jerry Mumphrey hit that one out. And the fans are letting the umpires know it right now. Wait a minute. That's Griffey. Yeah, it's the same guy. Just batted it over. They, I, they called that a foul ball. Yeah, that's what I was saying. All right. George Boy. Maloney came down and called it a foul. I still don't understand how that could be a foul ball. Well, the fans are booing because Griffey's now hit a home run. A good sinker. And he was looking for it. He just belted it out of here. Don't ask me why that was ruled a foul ball because I don't understand it. That looked fair to me. George Maloney, the third base umpire, came down and made that decision for Kaiser. Now here's Mumphrey. He grounds one down to second. That's Julio Cruz who throws him out. That's the second out of the inning. I'm wondering if there were, you know, it looked like uh, the bowling kicked the ball one time. I wonder if he didn't kick it. They thought the ball was in fair territory when he, uh, I mean, foul territory when he kicked it. I just wonder if that's what they're saying down there. It must be what how, Maloney's saying. Just tell me this. How can an area that's in front of home plate be in foul territory? I, I don't either. I don't, because I think Ken Kaiser was showing you where he thought the ball was in fair territory when he kicked it. Well, you could see it. The hole's right there in the ground. It's obvious that the ball was out in front of the plate. I, I frankly am absolutely baffled how they can call that ball foul. Anyway, here is John Mayberry with two outs, nobody on. He grounds one down to first. That's Jim Mailer. He tracks the ball over to the bag. That's finally the third out. But the Yankees do get one run here in the top half of the sixth inning. And at the end of five and a half now, it is Seattle five, the Yankees one. Let's pause for this message from your local station. Joe Simpson and Jim Mailer here in the bottom half of the sixth. Gaylord Perry going for win number 300. He's only nine outs away from doing that. He'll be the 15th pitcher in Major League history to accomplish that feat. Last one to do it was early win. That was 1963. He ended up with exactly 300 wins. Rudy Mays, the pitcher for the Yankees. He's in, re in relief. Of Doyle Alexander. Alexander went out after the third inning, so this is Mays' third inning of work. So far, he's done very well. Seven up, six up and down. The only hit he's allowed has been to Richie Zisk. Two balls, no strikes to Al Cowens. That pitch up high for ball three. 
if you're wondering about any active pitchers right now in either league who might be close to 300 or have a shot at 300 wins, Jim Cott has 279. He's the closest to Gaylord Perry. That pitch in for a strike three and one. But probably the man with the best chance would be Steve Carlton. He has 265. So he's only 35 away. Foul back. Might be playable. It's going to be close. Coming over and making the catch is Mayberry. So that's the first out of the inning. John Mayberry playing his first game for the Yankees tonight. Well, some of the people joined us late tonight because of the hockey game. We might recap that third inning in which uh, Seattle scored all five of their runs. Jim Mailer started off with a triple. Bud Bulling got a single to knock him in. Julio Cruz sacrificed bunt and then the catcher threw the ball away. Manny Castillo then single in a run. And Todd Cruz singled in two more, and Al Cowan tripled in one. All off Doyle Alexander. Well, Seattle bunched their hits when they needed them. They only have seven in the game, but they got five in that third inning. Here's Joe Simpson. Ground ball down to second. Willie Randolph, just an outstanding player, makes the out. 4-3. And coming up will be Jim Mailer. We mentioned early win as the number 14 man on the list of men who have won over 300 games. The number one man on that list is Cy Young. That's why they named the Cy Young Award after him. Gaylord Perry has won it twice. Once in the National League with San Diego, once in the American with Cleveland. And he's the only man to have won that award in each of those leagues. Cy Young won 511 games more than any other man. The next closest was Walter Big Train Johnson, who pitched for the Washington Senators. He won 416. Cy Young also lost the most number of games of any pitcher who ever lived. 313 losses. Well, in those days, a starting pitcher would start both games of a doubleheader, come back two days later and pitch another one. That's a lot of decisions. 824 decisions for Cy Young. No balls, two strikes. Maller looks at a pitch outside. They had rubber arms in the old days, didn't they, Monty? Yeah, they must have had. Ground ball down to short. Bucky Dent back in the lineup and throws him out. That's the third out of the inning, so Seattle goes one, two, three in the bottom half of the sixth. At the end of six complete now, and it is Seattle five and the Yankees one. We'll be right back after these words. With the one who we call our high first base camera. That's her shot. A part of a very happy crowd here watching Gaylord Perry go for win number 300. About 25,000 people. We don't have the official word yet. Gaylord Perry are only nine outs away from that win. And the crowd is starting to get excited. We ought to hear some cheers with every out. It's 5-1 Seattle. We're going to go to the top half of the seventh inning. And for more play-by-play, -play, here's my sidekick, Monty Moore. Thank you, Wes Parker. And hi again, everybody. Dave Winfield is struck out tonight and grounded to the pitcher to the shortstop. And at first, what happened is he hit a bouncer back up the middle. Gaylord deflected it out behind second. And Todd Cruz picked it up and threw him out. Gaylord has allowed only four well-scattered base hits tonight. One of them a home run after a controversial foul ball call. Balls popped up in the short left center field. And Joe Simpson calls for it. And Gaylord's one out closer. Bonnie, we've already had our switchboard lit up with phone calls. People want to know the name of that camera lady. It's Carmen. Carmen. All right. Here's Oscar Gamble, the designated hitter for the Yankees. are four games under 500 at this stage of the season. There's a strike call from Gaylord Perry. Oh, you're following the historical documentation of when Early Wynn got his 300th victory. He never got another one, though he did get into about oh, 10 or 15 more ball games for uh, Cleveland. But no more decisions, no more wins anyway. Pitch is low for a ball. I 
was in Kansas City the afternoon that uh, early win won his 300th, and he finished that day in the radio booth right next door to us in the Cleveland Broadcasting booth. He went down, took his shower up to five, and came back up and watched Jerry Walker save it for him. Cruz in the dirt to Mailer, and he dug it out. Nice play. Gaylord has not walked anybody. He has struck out three, and that's Todd Cruz who made this throw in the dirt. A lot of short steps would have charged this ball. Cruz has such a quick release and a strong arm that he decided to lay back, but it cost him. Mailer, however, makes a tremendous scoop out of that dirt. Not too tough a play because it bounced fairly close to him, but still a very good play. Roy Smalley, the Yankee third baseman, got a single in the second inning. Well, when you're not walking anybody, it takes a lot of hits to beat you, and Gaylord has just been splendid on control tonight. He hasn't even been behind people. He came out here tonight when he came out of the dressing room and out onto the field about 7 o'clock before the 7.30 game. He got a standing ovation from everybody here then, and out on the field at that time, the University of Washington Husky Band was playing, and they turned over that way and played towards him, saluting him. Everything has been directed Gaylord Perry here in this part of the United States today. sinker could have been a fork ball it wasn't thrown all that hard we saw him getting loose tonight in the dugout in the uh, bullpen he had three baseballs in his right hand practicing somebody just asked to see the baseball it's bill haller the umpire in chief went out there it was that man right there wes who all but undressed gaylord perry when he was pitching for cleveland one day in oakland he had him take his shirt off go in and change his shirt and his pants and his stockings. What about his hat? Did he have him change his hat? I, I'm not sure about that. Boy, I know he all but undressed him out there looking for something on the ball. All the talk about his spitballs and his grease ball and how many times have you ever heard of an umpire calling one on him? Almost never. Yankees are going to start calling for the ball a whole lot more now. Try to rattle him. You don't rattle this guy. Looking at the list, Marty, a man who have won 300 games. Number 11 on the list is Charles Radburn. He played mainly in the 19th century. He won 308 games, so Gaylord Perry really could conceivably move into the number 11 spot past him if he has an outstanding season. I think it's interesting to see how many games those guys pitched in to win 300 as compared to Gaylord. 2-2 two -two pitch. Boy, the crowd is roaring on every pitch he throws now. two strikes two down in the seventh inning the Mariners are leading the Yankees five to one that's the first man he's walked tonight Comes with two out we were mentioning earlier some of the people who might have joined us late didn't hear it we were talking about catfish hunter one of the great pitchers in his era in the major leagues now retired in a the farmer out in Carolina, in Hertford, North Carolina, and a young man who was his catcher in high school, Francis Coons, is here tonight in the ballpark and through batting practice for the Yankees prior to the game. <laughs> Telling us they had a uh, an all-star or a reunion of Catfish Hunters High School State Championship team the other day in Hertford, and Catfish hit a 440-foot homer off his brother, who's now the high school coach in Hertford. Pick misses inside ball one, and this crowd is, I think that foul ball call a little while ago, which cost Gaylord his shutout, set these people off up here. Mailer holding against Smalley at first base. Popped it foul back into the crowd. The ball bounced right off the walkway, the concrete walkway down below, right up into the press box, and some reporter made a two-handed catch. I'm beginning to think the way that lower deck is filled up, we may be close to 40,000 here tonight. They had 30,000 advance sold. And 
since the game started. People have been coming in off the boats and so forth up here, I guess, but this place is first two decks pretty filled up. Check swing foul ball over into the Yankee dugout area. There's a shot. I think this place holds, what, 60,000, something like that, money. Yeah, it's a possibility we've got that many, but as you can hear, they're vocal. All right, listen to them. One ball and two strikes. Get ready for the super sinker. Popped up. This crowd's going crazy. Mailer almost fell down. He tripped over the bag, but he recovered and made it. And they are with Gaylord now. I don't think there's any stopping him now. No runs or hits. One man left on in the middle of the seventh inning. The Seattle Mariners and Gaylord Perry lead the New York Yankees 5-1. to one. Let's pause now for this message from your local station. <laughs> Can you believe that ball stuck in that spot? Nope. <laughs> I can't. I can't. is thrown with intensity by a man like that. A lot at stake. You know, Monty, one interesting statistic. Every single player this century who has won 300 games has gone right into the Hall of Fame. And I'm sure that's on Gaylord's mind as well. But Bulling, the catcher tonight. I don't think this won't be a big night for him. Think back. And he makes it bigger by getting his second hit of the ball game. Winfield plays it off the wall. Bullings going. The challenge is on. He got there. Oh, what a throw by Winfield. I thought he'd misplayed the carom, West, but he got the ball. He got to it, not quite immediately. I'll tell you what the book is on Bud Bulling. If you're ever pitching against him, don't throw him a fastball. Well, you're right. He moved right into that throw well. And threw the ball on a one hop, little off line. I think he would have been there anyway. So it's a double, and here's Julio Cruz. Switch hitter off Rudy May, faking a bunt, trying to slap it by John Mayberry, the oncoming first baseman, and it fell off strike one. They're leading by four runs. The Mariners over the Yankees, five to one. Last half of the seventh inning, Gaylord Perry six outs away from baseball immortality. Strike taken. The crowd tonight, 27,369. So if they had 30,000 advance sold, 3,000 of them didn't make it. Quick mathematics here in the booth. is low. Rudy May, a veteran pitcher, has done quite a job on in relief for Doyle Alexander, who really didn't have it tonight. Rudy's given up only two hits. Foul tip. Julio's job right here just to get the ball on the ground on the right side of the infield and let the runner bowling go to third base. played very well at home this year. What did you say? They'd won seven out of ten prior to tonight. This would make it eight out of eleven. That's outstanding. It seems like the teams that play on artificial surfaces always play very well on it. Apparently the clubs that come in on, on the road just uh, have a hard time, I guess, going from grass to the unnatural uh, turf. See, there are four of them in the American League now, I believe. There's one in Toronto, one in uh, Minneapolis, one in Kansas City, and one here. Wow, that ball got away from Rudy Main. He don't have to sacrifice any longer. I don't know what he could have been trying to throw right then, but he definitely let it get away from him. It looked like he might have been trying to throw a screwball. That's the way it went, and his arm kind of went that way. What about Chicago, Money? Do they have that uh, artificial infield and natural outfield still? I don't know. Here's the pitch. I believe he was trying to throw a screwball, and it just stayed high and away. Yeah, you can see his wrist. Go to the rotation. Where's that? I haven't been in White Sox Park in 
what, two or three years. You know, I've never been there in my life. Never seen that ball. Park. I've never seen Wrigley Field. It's the only park in the big leagues I've never seen. Curve down and in for a ball. So on the way back tomorrow on the plane, you tell me about uh, Wrigley Field. I'll tell you about White Sox Park. All right. <laughs> But the big story tonight is we're at the Seattle Kingdom where the Yankees have brought their infield in now. Trailing by four in the seventh inning. They were back in that third inning all the way. Cruz pops it up in a short right. Not all that short either. Griffey's throw is on the fly to the plate. And holding on after the tag is Bud Bulling. some great throwing arms in this ballpark tonight. Cowens can throw. Simpson's got a good arm. Winfield has a great arm. Griffey has a certainly better than good arm. I don't know about Mumphrey. Must be good. Mumphrey has a pretty good throwing arm. Must be good to play center field at Yankee Stadium. Best arms I saw were Roberto Clemente for sure. Ollie Brown who was very underrated oh, yeah. as an outfielder. And Carl Perillo. Here's Manny Castillo. One for three tonight, knocked in a run in the third inning. They pitch out, expecting a squeeze play, and they don't get it. It's the seventh inning in Seattle, and this is Monty Moore with Wes Parker on the USA Thursday night Major League Baseball teleclass. We're glad to have you with us. Pitch out again. Are not in too bad a shape if they walk this man even. They got a left-handed batter coming up next. And a base open here. And I think they're just trying to outguess somebody. Gene Michael trying to outguess Rene Lachman. You don't usually see a squeeze when you have a four-run lead. Got a strike over two and one. We had quite a contest up here, a guessing contest with Gene Mock of the California Angels in first series of the year between those two teams. And Mock either had the signs or was very intelligently guessing because he pitched out five times in the series and caught four runners at second base on the Mariners. And Lashman said, I changed my signs rather radically. <laughs> I would have too. The young guy learned something from the old man. Bowling bluffing the stars, not coming. Ball hit up into the air to left field. Winfield can't get this one unless he gets it deep. It's over his glove. The runner was tagging at third, so he trots in. And Winfield throws behind him at second. The ball gets away after hitting the runner. A blast by Manny Castillo off the wall in left field. I thought Winfield was going to get it. having a good night that's his second hit and second RBI Winfield he's made some great catches like that in Yankee Stadium the walls a little bit higher here but he still plays this ball well just to hold it to a double it brings up Bruce Bakhti now with six to one lead for the Mariners and there is Castillo at second Bakhti is one for three tonight he got a double have nine hits off the Yankee pitchers. Rudy may miss it outside. Big curve. Well, he was guessing fastball. All the way right there. Next Thursday night will be an exciting night for me. For the first time I've been back to the Oakland Coliseum since I left broadcasting the Oakland A's in 1978. I hear it's a sellout already. <laughs> sure. As it was so many times when I was there. <laughs> Outside. It may be a sellout with the Yankees and the A's because they really are drawing the fans at Oakland Coliseum these days. And we're going to see quite a ball game there, I would imagine. Ricky Henderson, the Major League stolen base leader. Nobody's even close to him. Came up 
but they're not boxed in. It's fouled off. Do you think the Yankees have been hurt by the fact that they've used so many different lineups this year? I think probably it's gotta so. Gotta be, hasn't it, Wes? Absolutely. They they just don't look like they're an organized, cohesive group of ball players on that field. They they have the appearance of individuals rather than a team. It's something you can almost sense and feel. They just haven't come together yet. You've got to have teamwork in this game. It's hard to have it changing positions every night. There's a drive to left field by Boxy. And they're sending Castillo home. The ball is cut off, and they got a runner cut in a rundown. Mayberry handles it himself and gets Boxy. And that's why you put a man on the pitcher's mound as a cutoff man. But they got the run in. Castillo scores the seventh. Seattle run and Bucky did some big league hitting right there. Winfield had no chance to get the runner at the plate because the ball was hit so hard it drove him back on his heels. He couldn't get a whole lot of body into this and of course Bakhti doesn't care that he's thrown out. He's more than willing to give himself up just to make doubly sure that that run is going to score. That gives him a six run lead. It looks like an insurmountable lead for the Yankees to overcome. And Gaylord Perry, uh, I'd say, is about 99.9% .9 sure of getting that 300th win. It is 7-1 to one now. Rudy May to Richie Zisk, and he hits one in the air in the right field. He didn't get all that one out on the end of the bat. And Griffey puts it away. So that's all for Seattle. It may be enough. They got two runs in the inning, three hits. And nobody left after seven full innings at the Kingdom in Seattle. Gaylord Perry in quest of win number 300 is leading 7-1 over the Yankees. Baseball West, the fans here just gave a between-inning standing ovation to Gaylord Perry, and there's a definite endearment here for the fans to him. And I think it's interesting to note that this is the first year he's ever pitched in Seattle, yet he's already got this kind of a legion of a following. Uh, it, it's just that people all over baseball recognize a great accomplishment. I think that's partly it. I don't know that Seattle's ever really had a hero up here, and that could be it too, Money. Just the fact that this is their first chance to really go bananas over a baseball player. It's, it's the thing that we talked a little bit about last week as Bobby Mercer comes on as a pinch hitter for the Yankees or Bucky Dent, is that the players today move around so much that they really have to have fans all over the country rather than just those in one city anymore. Bobby Mercer, here's one of the great Yankees. And he's had to earn his way onto this ball club three or four different times. He's batting 250 this year with one homer. Oklahoma City, when Bobby joined the Yankees, he had a lot of pressure on him. They expected him to be another Mickey Mantle because he was from Oklahoma, a left-handed hitter and a big draft choice. He grounds out. And who could ever be another Mickey Mantle? But Bobby produced a lot of great days and even seasons for the Yankees. Back to the top of the batting order, here is Willie Randolph. This fellow right here might be the best all-around ball player on the Yankee team. He's a very steady ball player. He's got good speed, money, excellent defensively, good clutch hitter, and just enough power so once in a while he can jerk one out. Well, the shortstop and second baseman for Seattle are playing every hitter behind the white line, which would indicate the cutout on a dirt infield. They really play deep on this carpet. John of the Yankees was telling us tonight before the ball game that he is a neighbor of Kay Koplovich, the president of the USA Network, lives right down the road from him. Ball sliced off foul out of play. Whoop. He gets through it in the center field. Ball, one strike, one down in the eighth inning. The top of the Yankee batting order. Gaylord Perry. Snyder just misses outside. He didn't throw that ball very often. He cuts a fastball more or less. 
Got them all. Giving up only one home run tonight, or one run tonight. It was on a homer to Ken Griffey after they thought they had him out. Breaking ball, strike call. Do you understand that yet, how that ball could have been fouled? No, I don't. That thing hit like a like a good wedge shot on a wet green. <laughs> Stuck right in front of the plate. and two strikes. The fans here in Seattle, 27,000 plus, can say, as I said earlier tonight, I was there the night old Gaylord won his 300. Things like that you don't forget. Past the mound, he tried to get it barehanded. Cruz was playing deep. He didn't get it. Randolph beat it out, says Jerry Newdecker, the first base coach, the umpire, I should say. We mentioned they're playing him deep, and Perry might have gotten a little bit of his hand on it. I don't know. Cruz has such a quick release. Perry did touch the ball. He always falls over to the first base side, so he wasn't able to handle it. Some pitchers would have made that play. Look at that release. That was close. And it brings up Ken Griffey, who's had two hits tonight. Fielder shorten up a bit with the possibility of a double play. Gaylord got a double play in the third inning after an error was made by his third baseman and got out of a big jam. Just off the corner for ball one. This is a veteran umpiring crew out here tonight. Kaiser's the youngest of the bunch. Jerry Newdecker's been around a long time. Bill Haller is one of the most respected umpires in the game, I believe. Crew chief. George Maloney's been around a long time. Strike gets in there. You saw they're not holding the runner on at first base. Jim Naylor is playing behind Willie Randolph. Isn't it something what's happened to that Cincinnati machine that won in 75 and 76? Griffey now with the Yankees. Tony Perez with the Red Sox. Pete Rose with the Phillies, Joe Morgan's over with the San Francisco Giants, Cesar Geronimo is gone. That club is all over the place. Shanker calls back in the outside corner. Griffey had everybody playing deep and ran up on that ball. Griffey were going to bunt it. The Yankees are down by six runs. If they bunt here, it's not a sacrifice, but they're trying for the base hit. Well, this will be a well-chronicled event in tomorrow's press and in television and radio. The network people are all here. It's going to be a battle to see who gets to talk to Gaylord first after it's all over. I might be in the middle of that. Wes Parker's <laughs> going to be down there trying, I think. There's a base hit to left field by Ken Griffey. Good piece of hitting right there, and the Yankees are still alive in the eighth. And now Jerry Mumphrey comes on for New York. Nobody throwing in the Mariner bullpen. They want to let Gaylord wind it up. It'll be an interesting moment to see how soon Gaylord's brother Jim gets to him. They have great respect for each other. Didn't too many times pitch against each other. When Jim was pitching for Minnesota and Gaylord for Cleveland, I don't think they met all that often against each other. the ball. The thing that amazes me about Gaylord Perry is how many times he's been traded away in his career. In fact, in the past six seasons, he has played for five different teams. Texas, San Diego, the Yankees, Atlanta Braves, and now Seattle. There's another base hit. And Randolph is being stopped at third as the throw comes to the cutoff man down the line at third base. And the bases are loaded now on three consecutive hits for John Mayberry. Who just joined the Yankees tonight. Randolph, Griffey, and Mumphrey are on the sacks. All of a sudden, there's a lot of action down in the Seattle bullpen. Left-hander and right-hander get up and start throwing immediately. You can bet Caudill will be one of them, the right-hander. 
Yep, that's Bill Cottle, number 37. And Ed Vandenberg, number 32. And Dave Duncan, the pitching coach. Uh, the Mariners is out to talk to Gaylord. And Wes, you were asking Dave before the game, what do you say in a situation like this? That's right. I, I said, if you have to go out and talk to Gaylord Perry, what are you going to say to him? And at that time, he thought he would just remind him of certain mechanics. But I, I can't believe he's doing anything mechanically wrong. I would guess he's finding out if he's tired and remind him just to keep the ball down and go ahead and get this guy. They want to get the win. This telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball and is intended solely for the private, non-commercial use of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, retransmission, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game without the express written consent of Major League Baseball is prohibited. Mayberry after the sinker. Didn't get it. Strike one. Boy, this guy could put the Yankees back in the ballgame all of a sudden here with one swing of the bat. Mayberry, a longtime home run hitter in the American League, mostly for Kansas City. Recently for Toronto, just traded and joined the Yankees today. Fouled off, looked as if Mayberry tried to go the other way with that ball. And Perry is ahead of him at 0 2. And even in a double play situation, that infield, uh, Todd and Julio Cruz is playing very, very deep, particularly Julio Cruz at second. Because Mayberry, as slow as he is, they could still double him up if that ball would get to him in a hurry. Look out, super sinker. Look out. You got it. He struck him out, and the crowd rises as one. Second out of the eighth inning. Mayberry down looking. He put that one right in the center of his belt buckle. Pitching in the kitchen, I call it. Looked like he hit that low inside corner right where the target is. Absolutely a perfect pitch. That ball backed up. It had so much on it that time. Back to fastball right up over that inside corner. Boy, a big out right there, but he's not out of the woods yet. Here's Dave Winfield. Gaylord could throw uphill to this guy and still throw strikes. Six feet, seven inches tall. He is struck out, he's grounded out, and he's flied out to center. Now the infield is playing so far back and can hardly be considered infielder. That's going to be a tough play. Barehanded, Gaylord made the play but couldn't get him. Winfield can run. Boy, how do you talk about a Baltimore chop? There's a Seattle one. It's seven to two. That is so hard to do to catch a ball barehanded, get any kind of a decent grip and throw a guy out. It's right off the plate, real, real high. You can see Gaylord saying, I got it, I got it. Winfield's sprinting for the bag. Now he's got to somehow get a grip and throw that ball. He'd made a superb play, but just couldn't get him. It's a good sinker. You'll see Winfield swing right over the top of it. It goes straight down off that plate and then straight up in the air. I'll bet that went 20 feet up. If that one would have hit that same dirt that Griffey's hit a little while ago, it'd been out of sight. As hard as he hit it. He'd have buried it. It is seven to two now. And here's Oscar Gamble with the bases still loaded. Gaylord absolutely tiring here in this inning. You know that. This is the eighth inning. He's pitched two complete games this year. Strike call. Gamble tonight 0 for 3. Twice he's flying out to the outfield, once grounded out to the infield. Mariners 7, Yankees 2. Yankees have 8 hits. Cruz way back. Got it. Throws to the second baseman. They didn't get him. A run score. Now there's one of the troubles of an infield playing so deep they can't get to second base to cover when they've got to play. That's the problem right there. Boy, you're right about that, Money. It's almost hard, impossible to believe the ball's hit so hard. He could have thrown the runner out at first base. He elected to go to second. But Julio Cruz was playing so deep. Look at him trying to get to the bag. He just can't beat the runner. Great Winfield hustle. Beat him. Great hustle by Winfield. That's five hits here in the inning. It's seven to three now. And here is Roy Smalley. The bases are still loaded. Now it's dangerous because a grand slam would tie the game. I tell you, Todd Cruz made a poor choice of plays right then. Oh, I 
I'll tell you, he got away with a pitch. Look at Smalley's reactions. He had one to jerk out of here. If our cameras could, rather than the runners, if we could get a look at where Cruz, the second baseman, is playing right now, you could find out why there's no way Todd Cruz could make a force play at second base. Todd Cruz would have been smart to throw that ball to first. Smalley pops it up, and they ought to get out of it. Hockey, Hendrick. Got him. Two runs, five Yankee hits. Bases left loaded. We go to the last half of the eighth inning. The score is Seattle 7, New York 3. Let's pause for this message from your local station. ask you a question, Monty Moore. Why do you think Gaylord Perry was traded so many times in his career? Well, if, if they, look at Gaylord. Maybe it's because the hair kept getting in his eyes. Look at that. That's Gaylord right there. No, you hear a lot of things. That's Latchman over asking him probably how he feels. You want to go one more? There was a thing written in the Los Angeles Times today about him. said that he was a clubhouse troublemaker on some ball clubs. And, uh, you know, you hear these things. Uh, it might be because that he had so much, uh, such a big uh, amount of money that he was asking for at certain times. Though up here, I understand he played, he signed a contract with the Mariners for forty thousand dollars this year, which is peanuts. That's what the rookies get. The minimum salary is thirty-five thousand bucks now. Uh, though he does have a bonus clause where he, they say he could make up quite a bit. That shot of him where you saw he's lost a lot of his hair. Some of the sports writers yesterday were saying, "How come your brother has so much more hair?" To finish a story, they were asking yesterday in the press conference why Gaylord Perry had so little hair compared to his brother Jim, who apparently has quite a lot. And Gaylord said, "Said, well, my brother won 200 games, so he still got his hair. I won. I'm going to win 300. I've lost all mine." Yeah. He's been out there a lot of times. Boy, he's gone to the post over and over and over. Do you realize what you have to do to win 300 games, Monty? That means you've got to win 15 games for 20 consecutive years. Well, Wes, he won his 200th game in 19, uh, I believe it was 1968. So he's only won 100 games in the last 14 years. All right, here is Todd Cruz against Rudy May. Big swing and a miss, strike one. Monty, I'm heading down for the dugout, see if I can possibly get Gaylord coming off the mound. I'll see you back up here, partner. It won't be easy. You got that right. Cruz, Collins, and Simpson for the Mariners. And those two runs, the Mariners got him in the uh, seventh inning. Look pretty big right now. Base hit for Todd Cruz right up the middle she goes. You might see Renee Leitchman and the Mariners playing for one run now. Trying to get that margin back up there a little bit. Get it out of the Grand Slam range. He's taking and it's a strike. Rudy May came on in relief in the fourth inning. His team was down five to nothing. He has allowed four base hits, or make it five hits, since he came in. Doyle Alexander gave up six while he was there for three innings. Strike two to Collins. Hope you enjoyed our telecast. There's the young manager, Renee Lashman, taking a look around at the bullpen area and see what's going on down there. That's low for a ball. Many of you, because of the hockey game, did not get to see the early part of this baseball game, so the USA Network is going to play back a videotape of the game from the very first in its entirety right after we're through here tonight with the live telecast. So if you missed the early part, we had some features on Gaylord and things that you might enjoy seeing. Fouled off down the third base line.
Fenton, first base coach for the Seattle Mariners, and Chuck Cottier, the third base coach. Mayors elect the line score. Seattle is out at the Yankees 11-9. Seattle's had a bunch of gap shots tonight, extra base hits. Cruz leads off first with a count of one and two. He'll never back to the mound. May's going to go to second base. They got him there, but there won't be any throw to first. A rolling block down at second by Ty Cruz. Made sure Willie Randolph didn't get that throw away. So there's one out, and up comes Joe Simpson, the center fielder for the Mariners. Remember next Thursday night, the Yankees and the Oakland A's from the Oakland Coliseum. Be on the air at 10.30 Eastern Time right here on the USA Network. Curve low, ball one. Manners got five runs in the third inning. Todd Cruz got a big two out single to drive in two runs. Collins followed with a triple to drive in one more. being tagged there by Mayberry. They were teammates on a very fine Kansas City team for several years. down the chute for a call strike. Things are really popping right now. Exciting for the sports fans to follow the USA Network with NASL hockey, missile, or uh, NASL hockey, and missile soccer is also underway. Their playoffs very exciting. Simpson tried to golf that one. NBA basketball playoffs, the National Hockey League playoffs. Major League Baseball, all kinds of tennis. USA Network, prime time sports all the time. Broken bat looper to the second baseman and they got the easy double play right there. We go to the top half of the ninth inning. Hang on. Gaylord Perry is three outs from 300. The score of the ball game as we go to the top of the ninth. The Mariners seven and the Yankees three. The Miners, but that was a short stay. Here is Rick Cerrone, and Gaylord misses outside for ball one. Gaylord's first win in the big leagues was against the Pittsburgh Pirates, a team that had Roberto Clemente, Dick Stewart, pretty good hitters on that ball club. Billy Burton, Billy Mazeroski, I'm sure you'll be asked about that first win, April 25th, 1962. I'll tell you what, he's got a pretty good pension. He doesn't have to stay up here. He'll be making good money when he retires from baseball because that pension plan in baseball is the best anywhere. And he is a vested member of long standing. He's gone to a two ball, one strike count on Rick Cerrone. Yankees have pinch hitter Larry Milborn on deck. Got it over. Monty, there's only been three pitchers in the last 55 years who have won 300 games or more. An early win we mentioned. The other is Warren Spahn, who was fifth on the list with 363, and the third was Lefty Grove. Lefty had exactly 300, just like early win. Two balls, two strikes to count. We're in the ninth inning. 
Monty Moore with Wes Parker on the USA Network. It's Gaylord Perry performing, and he's got that short hopper. One down in the ninth inning. And now up comes Larry Milborn, a pinch hitter for the New York Yankees. Boy, this would be something. His 299th and 300th victories against the New York Yankees within a period of about 10 days. his rookie season some of the big league pitchers of note that year were Jack Sanford of the Giants Don Drysdale of the Dodgers Bob Perky and Joey Jay of Cincinnati Ralph Terry of the Yankees Ray Herbert of the White Sox all won 20 games that year as did Camilo Pasquale of Minnesota and Dick Donovan of Cleveland those were the big names in his rookie year he has outlasted all of them none of those has won 300 games in his career One and oh, count to Milburn. Fouled away into the upper deck. Well, I know Gaylord's parents are watching in Carolina tonight. And some of his kids are back there tonight. His daughter Beth, age 18, and Allison, 16. They're in Williamston. It's prom weekend back there, so they couldn't come. Popped up. Foul territory. Maybe a chance. Nope. It's about three rows deep back into the press. Gaylord has a son, Jack, age 14. And he is a player on his high school team in Williamston. They've got games this weekend, so he couldn't come. But his parents, Evan and Ruby Perry, are at home in Williamson tonight. One and two count. Watch this one. Pops it up. Boy, that's right up the elevator chute. Julio Cruz is there. Two down, he only needs one. It's Willie Randolph of the Yankees standing between Gaylord Perry and baseball immortality, and he's going to get the last out with a standing ovation. Everybody here is on his feet, and everybody here is cheering. Wes, is this an exciting moment or not? It is. He's moving into some very select company. Cy Young, Walter Johnson, Christy Matthewson, Grover Cleveland, Alexander. Not too many get up there. Ball one. And young guys like Bud Bulling, Manny Castillo, Todd Cruz, Julio Cruz, Jim Mailer, young guys like Joe Simpson and Bruce Bakke and Al Collins can say, I played that night. And boy, they were hardly born when Gaylord started pitching. What a thrill for a guy like Bulling to be catching this ball game. One and oh, count to Randolph. He got it over. Boy, you can lift the crowd umpire here. Everybody's ready to make a charge to the mound. Oh, listen to this crowd. That's the ball. You know who else has got a heart pumping right now? Ken Kaiser, that home plate umpire. Because if it's a questionable call for strike three or something, he's the guy that's got to make it. Think of the number of pitches that right arm has delivered over the years. Thousands and thousands. That might be the last one before 300. Cruz, the main horse, that does it. Gaylord Perry gets the ball in the handshake. And a congratulations to his teammates. And ladies and gentlemen, you're in on baseball history. It'll go on from this moment, but boy, he 
did it. The first chance he had to get 300, and he has done it. Boy, would I love to see his wife right now. A great shot. He's throwing a kiss to her. She's right up behind the dugout. I'm happy for him. i got to tell you. Well, that'll be a great press conference down there. They call him back out, Wes. I remember Wally Moon, my rookie year, saying baseball is an endurance contest. Gaylord Perry has endured. Boy, a lot of pitches, money, a lot of different ball clubs. He has just hung in there. That man has tremendous stamina, tremendous courage. Well, the crowd is still standing and cheering. Nobody's leaving. They want Gaylord to come out by himself. They're chanting Gaylord. Here. We're going to take a look. He's almost a sure bet for the Hall of Fame. And of course, he started with Juan Marshall and the San Francisco Giants. Marshall will probably go to the Hall of Fame, too. Quite a combo. Juan Marshall, Gaylord Perry. That's where it all began. That door right there goes back up into the Mariners Clubhouse, where I'm sure there's a big celebration going on. Take a look at the last out again. He got a good hitter, Willie Randolph. Willie couldn't get a hit off of him tonight. 0 for 4. Goes the other way, right to the second baseman. Gaylord already starting to get excited. The same thing for Cruz. And here comes Gaylord back out again. The throw, and that's number 300. Here comes Gaylord Perry out of the dugout again. opportunity and did not do it. Only the Mariners, a long ways from home, gave him this opportunity to come back and pitch this year, and he has rewarded the Seattle fans and the management with this fine effort. Let's see what it meant to him. We'll just stay right on Gaylord Perry as the ball goes out to second. He sees the catch. Now the throw. That's it. You got it, Gaylord. <laughs> and there's that precious memory that baseball he's got right there will end up in the Hall of Fame, and so will he. I think a lot of ball clubs felt that he was only interested in that 300th win and didn't give him credit for still being an outstanding pitcher, which he is, Monty. Last year he won eight games, but it was only about a half a season. He could have won 15 or 16 last year, and he very well made this year. Well, I'm glad we got a change this week. The Baltimore and California game might be exciting tonight, but nothing like this. And that's the end of the ball game with the final score. The Mariners winning at 7-3. We'll be back with a wrap-up in just a moment. Uh, has been the kind of a game that can turn you on from the early moments and for the baseball fans we're a little bit more than sorry you didn't get to see the whole thing but I guess Wes if you could pick half the ball game to see our fans got to see the right half I think it's certainly worth seeing money you don't see these things happen very often and, and it's one of the real magical moments in baseball history it, it's something that baseball fans are all interested in there's statistics and the amount of strength energy that went into tonight's win, uh, which is the culmination of a long career for Gaylord Perry, it's just hard to imagine what he's been through. I admire the man. He's really a swell guy. Just a super fella. Good sense of humor. Nice down-to-earth man out of North Carolina. And to see this happen to him, I know his family's delighted for him, and he's thrilled. Wes, I know you've been around baseball for a long time, and you've seen a lot of emotional things happen uh, around the Dodgers when you played for them. Uh, at 
the Seattle Kingdom, people are still hanging around here just talking about this great moment that happened here. And I'm just starting to ask Wes, uh, you've been around the game a long time, Wes. You've seen a lot of emotional moments happen with the Dodgers. Anything rival this that uh, just comes to the top of your mind right quickly? Well, we won a World Series in my second year. My rookie year as a starter, that meant a great deal to me. What I think the fans don't realize, what I'd like to point out, is you cannot imagine what it's like to go on the road as a professional ball player for some 20 years, the hotels, the plane flights, the, the nights when you're trying to go to sleep and there's a party next door and you can't go to sleep and you tell them to be quiet and they won't be. They tell you to go take a hike. And What you go through on road trips and in some cases abuse from fans, uh, to, to last through that for 20 years and to get where he has gotten, boy, you just can't imagine. He'll probably write a book one day about it, another book. And I, I admire the man's endurance and his courage and what he's been through and where he has come to. Mark. You, you have to give him the credit. And what he's done on the field to win 300 West with, as you mentioned earlier tonight, five different ball clubs. And to see this kind of reaction from the crowd here tonight, though he really is not known as a Seattle Mariner. He's never been uh, up here with any allegiance whatsoever until he got here, and they gave him the chance to win that 300th here tonight. And uh, Dan O'Brien, their general manager, said he's going to win some more for us, too, because they're not going to cut him off. He's here for the year and for the duration. But what he's had to go through with on the field with all those different clubs and as you've mentioned he's matured so much because in his early years he got mad when people made errors behind him he was that kind of a competitor he was over that because it happened here tonight it's a tremendous learning experience professional baseball and what you go through because you really have to learn how to roll with the punches you you take a lot of punches and he has and where some of those managed to get through it and i think another thing that we can't overlook is the fact that this man won 300 games right but in winning 300 games he did something that many of the other 300 game winners never did do he won a Cy Young Award, which is emblematic of the best pitcher that year in your league, and he did it in both leagues. He did it in both leagues, and he won over 20 games five different times. He's won a lot of big games. Uh, he, he always gives you a tremendous effort. He just has great courage, Money, and, and it's it's. I hope we've given some idea of what you have to go through to get to where he's been, because it certainly isn't easy. Well, I can hardly wait to get out of that dressing room and shake his hand. I, I've always admired him uh, quite a bit, and uh, he's pitched against the teams that uh, for which I broadcast before going into network broadcasting and I always just love to beat him because when you beat him you beat the best <laughs> you know and if you have a night where you beat Gaylord Perry in those days and as tonight if the Yankees would have beaten him they beat him on a great night and he was thrilled when we saw him out here early this afternoon taking batting practice and he doesn't even hit in the American League he was just trying to work off I think some of that excess energy well it's baseball history and we'll probably see more before our careers are over are over money but this is one that I will definitely remember and and for those people who don't know Gaylord, I'm sorry we didn't have a chance to interview him. We would have loved to, but you can imagine what it's like down there. If you'll take my word for it, he is a very fine gentleman. You would like him. And one thing about it, you'll be able to read all about it in the papers tomorrow because this was the big story in sports tonight. They were all here from all the networks and from all the newspapers, and they'll all have it well chronicled tomorrow. And you're going to be able to say, well, I saw that one, and it had a unique thing in it. As Wes said, I've been around baseball 20 years. I've never seen a ball hit and stick in the ground <laughs> in front of home plate. And if it had not been for that man, Ken Griffey, getting another chance, one umpire overruling the home plate umpire and calling it a foul ball rather than a fair, Griffey would not have hit the home run. And who knows, he may have had a shutout here tonight. We're going to see Gaylord Perry and Juan Marshall in the Hall of Fame. Uh, well, Juan Marshall shortly. Gaylord Perry five years after he retires, whenever that is. Well, that's the story from here in Seattle. The Mariners win it 7-3. to three And don't lose sight of the fact that these Mariners are playing pretty good baseball right now. They're only two games under 500. Our baseball game next week on the USA Cable Network, these Yankees again, and it'll be against the exciting Oakland A's with Ricky Henderson, Murphy, and all those guys. And don't forget, too, a replay of this ball game, every pitch of it, plus an opening feature on Gaylord Perry, will be coming up right here on the USA Network next. Tonight's game was brought to you by Budweiser Light. When you bring out your best, you deserve ours. And by Toyota, who invites you to see the totally redesigned Celica. Test drive the stylish performer at your local Toyota dealer. Executive producer for tonight's game was Jim Zrake. Our producer, Gary Dubin. Associate producer, Steve Peter. Our director, Billy McCoy. And the assistant director, Renee George, with Steve Peter. Our associate director, Rob Nielsen, in the booth with us tonight. 
And now for Wes Parker, this is Monty Moore saying thanks a million for joining us and wishing all of you a good night from here in Seattle, Washington. Once again, the final score, the Mariners and Gaylord win it 7-3. So long, everybody. See you next week.